hit it, but somewhere in it, I didn't get it directed to here, so I don't know where it went. Gotcha. Probably sent it to somebody else. <laughs> no. Anyway, we're we're up and running today, so we're in good shape. Um, good evening. It looks like snow outside, so hopefully it won't be deep by the time class gets out. Um, maybe it'll just stay rain. I don't think it's forecasted here. Although I saw a huge pile of snow that slid off somebody's truck in the parking lot here when I got here the second time today. So I guess it's that time of year. It's January. But it's near the end of January. Jake is still at the top of the class on the investment scene. And as of close of market today, I am at the bottom of the class. <laughs> I am number 15. Uh, I will change that. Uh, I, I made four bad calls, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a guessing game. I have rationale behind my calls. And if it stays south, or if I don't pull out of it, I'll explain to everybody what I did and how it can go. Uh, what I read wrong, and uh, what, how the market read it differently <laughs> than I did. And when we look at, at the market, we, we saw in the video that we watched, at the end of the class, watched a half of the video, uh, by the author of our textbook. And he's impressive, by the way, didn't you think? He, he's he's got, uh, uh, got things dialed in in finance, and, and it would be, it goes to uh, uh, reflect well on Harvard. <laughs> they, they pick out good guys, usually, uh, that are capable uh, and, and competent. And, and he, uh, we'll watch the second half of that video today, but when, uh, when you look at at uh, the mess in between a household that wants to invest in a company and a company that needs cash. That's how he started out. It needs to be simple, he said, but it's not. And in the middle, there's a whole bunch of what he called a mess. You've got all of these uh, actors that are um, in it for themselves. They're earning a living. And, and we see that kind of a mess. He called it a conflict. Uh, between agency, and we, we see that in other industries. We see that, for example, in real estate. Different states have different laws or rules about who can represent who. In Illinois, an agent represents only themselves. And uh, if you list with an agent, they are representing themselves, which is nice because they're going to try to get the most money they can question mark? Or are they going to try to flip it fast? You don't know for sure. They may need cash and they may need to undersell your home so it'll sell fast so they can benefit. But they make no pretension in Illinois about representing you. They're representing themselves. You have to have a lawyer in between uh, in a real estate transaction in Illinois. Many other states. Most other states as well. Utah, you do not. Utah is the uh, central um, uh, story feeder to American greed. <laughs> we have an awful lot of scam artists in, in Utah, and some of that is not because of our culture or our propensity to cheat people or anything like that. It's because some of our laws make it easy for predators. You know, and if, if it's not controlled as easily, well then guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to misuse it. Uh, that's why we can't write checks anymore, right? Some people have used it. And, and so we can't do that anymore, in hardly anywhere. Uh, nobody takes a check. We have other ways of paying because that system got abused and misused. And so in, in the whole finance world, there's this mess that he called where everybody is, is, is supposed to be uh, representing uh, whoever they've signed up contractually with, they not necessarily do. We think they're lying. We think that they're, you know, when, oh, we got a new deal, this new product is going to be blah, 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 and we're pretty sure they're lying to us. They just want to sell the product, right? And maybe it will, maybe we won't deliver what they want to sell. And in real estate, in, in Utah, uh, we've standardized the contracts, so you don't have to hire a lawyer to, to uh, write up what's called a REPC, the real estate uh, agreement. And a, an agent who is uh, trained can, can or who's licensed uh, by the Department of Professional Licensing in Salt Lake City, they can write the REPC up for you, and 
they can represent you uh, when you sell your house. Now, when you're buying a house, it's the agency question is always on the table. Are you buying it from the agent that listed the house? If so, who are they really representing? Are they representing the seller or are they representing the buyer? And if you're the buyer, you want an agent that can go hand-to-hand -hand combat with the agent that is the seller's agent, right? And so whether you are a listing agent or a seller's agent, the laws have gone back and forth in the state of Utah about what kind of realtor you need or can, can hire. And now with online sales going, I bought a house from eBay. There's no, no realtor involved at all. You don't have to have a realtor to buy to do stuff. And, and, and so the, the, the rules of investment and return get a little murkier, right, with buying houses. Right now, you know, we've, there's a show, Flipping Vegas, and you see part of that has to do with uh, what they buy in and what they, what they, what they pay and, and then what the realtor fees are gonna be when they flip the house. You know, you can go, you can be all real good until you flip and put the realtor fees on top of it. You just spent $40,000 more in fees. And now all of a sudden your, your cash flow goes south because you gotta pay out that at closing. It's not an arbitrary pay, you have to pay that. It, it, they subtract it, you never get it. And so the fees are, are paid and sometimes that uh, makes a difference. And we see in that show, I don't watch it very often, but the guy's always in a, in a having a heart attack because that's what makes people watch TV shows where they're arguing over you know how fast that's going to cost me three days. Well, what's three days? Three days is that's money is being tied up three more days. And we see that on that show the importance of velocity of turns. How fast the merry-go-round is going around. If you flip one house a year, your entire costs have to be absorbed in that one flip. But if you flip one a week or you flip one a month you know, that you're deferring over different time frames. And so the profit has to have a time frame attached to it, whether we're in the real estate market or stock market, there's the same kind of, of thing. He talked about in that mess that he drew between the household that wants to put money and help a company out and the company that needs cash, one of the things he talked about was institutional investors. He talked about sovereign funds. That was a line item that was on that slide that he had up that we all looked at. What are investment players? What are investment funds? What is that group, institutional investors? What is that's it? That's what they do for a living. Okay, that's what they do for a living. That's the whole purpose, right? Yeah I, yeah. I have money for you to invest, or I have money to invest in you with the understanding that there is going to be a payout for me Okay. on top of whatever I invest so in So an institutional investor in that case would be anybody that is in the mutual fund business, for example. We've, we've learned about mutual funds in the last years. We've, they didn't used to be available, but they're available now. What is a mutual fund? What does the word mutual mean? Beneficial for both parties. Yeah, it's a bunch of people collected together. So one person doesn't have to watch the market. We hire a guy to do that. And we're gonna take a whole bunch, we're gonna take everybody in this class, and each one of us is gonna put 100 bucks into it, but since Jake's doing the best, we're gonna let Jake watch the market and invest it for us. Now collectively, uh, we all put 100 bucks in, that's a nice little pot of money. Uh, Jake's gonna manage it, we've gotta pay him to do that, right? And, and so that's how mutual funds work. We, we pay somebody who's, that's all they do, is represent our mutual fund, hopefully, or the SEC, it, it, it turned out that didn't always happen. Uh, we, and so the SEC started to police uh, uh, mutual funds, and, and Vanguard, for example, has all kinds of funds. And if you look up Vanguard and, and, and look up the various funds they have, they're all related type of a mutual fund, but they might be you know, geared specifically differently. Uh, I might be interested in Chinese up and coming companies that are doing well in the US and I want international stock bought. It's riskier, but I like that. 
And so there'll be a fund that's just doing uh, Tokyo board and Chinese board, Chinese boards, uh, uh, buying stocks off of those, and that's where our investment money is going. Another Vanguard fund is a real estate for commercial properties. Another is real estate for apartment holdings, uh, millions of dollars of apartment holdings, and they're investing in that. And I may like that, and so I buy into that fund. It may be um, that they are investing in uh, 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 high-risk stuff because there are some people that want to get a bigger gain and are willing to take a bigger loss in the event the market goes upside down and they, they are put into a fund that can do that. Or there's others that are like me and don't want to work a ton of more years. Uh, and so I, I want, I can't afford to recover if I lose a big amount of my portfolio because I don't have enough years left to do that in all probability. The actuarial say that, that I have less to live than, than most, probably all of you in the room. And, and uh, whether that's true or not, none of us know what one day is going to bring forth. We all have no guarantees of our lifespans, but, but there, are, there are statistical, is statistical data there, and says so that I might want to invest in surer things that aren't as risky. I might want to invest in things that are going to pay dividends so that maybe I, maybe I can live off of the dividends only on, on a portfolio. Wouldn't that be awesome? So the portfolio will preserve and pass on to my heirs, and I could live off of the dividends. So that mutual fund would need to be invested in something that has dividends, that pays out dividends. Uh, some stocks are known for paying out dividends every year, kind of no matter what. Johnson & Johnson's an example, medical company. They almost always uh, pay out dividends. And one of their strategies has been, uh, they have approached their shareholders um, saying, if you'll sign this contract with us, uh, we will automatically reinvest your dividends in our stock. So you don't even have to think about it. You don't get cash money. They pay a dividend, and guess who they're paying? Themselves. They're paying themselves, the, the, the invest, and they're pumping up their own stock with by their own investors buying more stock in their company. That's good for their company, and it, it saves it. It's kind of like they ought to pay on your cell phone. They're pretty sure they're going to get the money that way. And, and you, you don't have to do that, but you can opt to do that. So mutual funds do that, and since mutual funds have been so successful, that's an institutional buyer, by the way. If I'm Vanguard, and I buy stock, I don't buy 100 shares. I buy 100,000 shares. I make a big move in the market with, because I've got this fund behind me that's got millions in it. So when I'm, when I'm replace, repositioning stock yesterday, steel stocks didn't do well, energy stocks did. So I move money for institutionally, I move money out of one market sector into another. Those are, that creates waves in the pool. Those are big amounts. And uh, since that has been so successful, we have something else that was invented a decade ago or more called hedge funds. And hedge funds is the same idea, regulated less. It's more a group of buddies putting money together and buying racehorses or race cars or investing in NASCAR and, and doing things that, that have great returns available. Anybody can meet a few SEC requirements. We in this class could start a hedge fund if we wanted to do that. It's much less regulated. Uh, and uh, therefore, the rules of how we invest are fewer. So we can take bigger risks. Uh, one of the things that's kind of a truism of all public companies and the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, that sets the rules for how you buy and sell and how companies present themselves, one of their magic terms is protection of the widows and children. And that, that's kind of a, a biased statement if you want to talk about that, but the truth is there's an awful lot of widows and children that own stock. Their husband uh, bought stock or got stock in the companies that they worked in, and they died before the women died. And that's statistical fact. That's not gender bias or anything. It's just, you know, some of them do kill their husbands. I, I understand that. But for the, for the most part, that's not how that works. Uh, women tend to outlive the men and because um, uh, they drive slower. I, I don't know what it is for sure, but anyway, there's something doing that. 
And, and uh, because of that, they didn't make the, 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 it's not that a woman is not capable of making a buying decision in stock and how to place their investment. It's not that at all. It's just that, that in America's history, there have been groups of investors, predominantly women and children, that have stock. And they need protection because they're not actively involved in decision making. And so the SEC says, we will protect them from companies lying to them about their financials. Uh, and and if, if a company is proven not to do that, uh, then what happens is called a shareholder derivative lawsuit. Uh, I have been the recipient and had to defend shareholder derivative lawsuits that are put together by minority shareholders, not women and children. Just anybody that owns less than 50% of a company can file a lawsuit against the company uh, saying you mismanaged my money and you have to defend that. And you have to prove you did or didn't. I, my lawyer on the first one that I got, I inherited it. I, didn't, I wasn't driving the bus when uh, the company made the decisions. Uh, I inherited it and had to, had to work at that. My lawyer said, well, it's an interesting thing with these laws. You cannot get a felony for being stupid in investment. Uh, you make what you think was a good decision in your company, and it turns out to be a bad one. It was stupid. You know, Coke did a, Coke, a, a, a new Coke uh, a, a 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It failed and bombed. They spent $2 billion on that. That was a dumb move. But you can't sue Coke for making that dumb move. You can't sue them for being stupid. You can sue them for maliciously doing something that they know will turn out badly or will self-serve them and at your expense as a shareholder. That you have protections in. And, and that's what you have to demonstrate if you get a, a minority shareholder lawsuit uh, in a, in, against your company by people that are minority shareholders. Now, the, the laws are there for public companies, but they bleed over to private companies and they protect private companies in something that's called common law. When, when the rules are so well established in public companies, that it seems like this is the right way to run your private company, then usually the courts will find in favor of what is the common law. Uh, and and uh, how that uh, impacts your company, let's suppose you and one other person start a partnership and you open up uh, a, a business and the business is doing well and life is good and uh, your partner works so hard that, uh, that her husband gets really mad and divorces. And he's, he's a, he's a uh, end the clouds jerk, and he's now your partner. Because in the divorce settlement, she got, he got half of her assets, which is part of your company. That person just got part of your company. And unless you have that managed in some way in a buy-sell agreement, in the partnership agreement between you and your partner, uh, you gotta live with it. So, we talk about that a lot when we're, when we're uh, coaching people and are starting a business. We all like to start with partners because you, know, you spread out uh, the, the, uh, uh, the jobs, the work, and, and you combine talent and it's nice and maybe somebody's going to put money into it so you make them a partner and you're going to be the day to day and they're going to be behind the scenes your partner and, and help the business. But, but they're your partner. So what that means is something happens to them their heirs are now your partner. So now you're in business with their kids if they die. Or if they get divorced, you're in business with their ex-wife or ex-husband. Unless you managed for that when you put the original corporate articles, the articles of the corporate uh, partnership, uh, together. And, and you, there are common ways of handling that. I could, in another class, we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, today, that's not our topic for today. Uh, but that's the, the idea there is that you may have a minority shareholder in your business that you didn't mean to have when you started out. Uh, that minority shareholder could even be like Zion's Bank. <laughs> they loan you some money and you sign, you sign some guarantees, which most of the time when you start out a business, you're undercapitalized, you have to borrow money, and you have to sign a guarantee. That guarantee gives Zion's Bank uh, access to the title of your house, uh, access to your business. Uh, they can force pieces of your business to be sold if you are defaulting on agreements with them. So these legal issues can get messy 
in public companies for sure, but in our little tiny companies as well. And so we want to talk about that a little bit because this, the rules that apply to the old aggregate market often bleed over and apply to our tiny little business as well. And those disagreements uh, break friendships, uh, break companies, uh, and may cost you uh, a complete do-over, you know, starting all over again. And, and lots of people have had to start over again and have been successful, and a lot of people have been ruined and never able to start over, they're never able to get back to where they were. Uh, and so this is something we want to avoid, <laughs> right, if we can't go on in. And that'll be one of the things we talk about. We're learning from giant companies, but, but we're understanding a bu bunch of this is very applicable to our small businesses. Brock asked a question about how do we know uh, what other companies are doing? Uh, and and uh, I've, I've always been interested in that, and I've always, I've always asked uh, my accounting firms, the various ones that I've had over the years, is I'll, I'll, I'll ask them, but you know, there's a, there's a hairdresser shop. I know you're their, their person. Don't tell me the, the very you know, sensitive information there, but how much money do they make? Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued, I, I'm interested. The pizza shop, how much money do they make? Really, how much money? It looks like, the, looks like business is great, but how much money do they make? And so certain co kinds of companies, uh, the data is pretty available. The guys that own McDonald's franchises. Uh, you know, we got brother, two brothers that own the ones here in St. George, and, and we know per store a range just because there's a lot of McDonald's. We know how much money they make. Uh, we know if you're running the business right, we know kind of how much money they should be keeping. We kind of know, you know, McDonald's about a million dollar company, a store, you know, about that in revenue. And if you don't, if you want to look closer, you can count cars. You can see what, you know, what do you think a, 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 re a restaurant? You know, you can you can look at at a day's uh, how many how many how many dinners they sell, how many pizzas they make in a day, and you can extrapolate that, and you can kind of get an idea of what their volume is, right? A lot of businesses, you can look at the sales tax information. They're paying tax on what they sell uh, to the to the state, and uh, there's county sales tax as well. They try to keep that a secret. The state of Utah does, but there's lots of leaks. And so you can see what a competitor is doing in sales tax a lot of times. You get an idea of how much money they are or aren't making based on gross. You don't know what they're keeping, but you know you get an idea of how, how busy their business really is, how much activity do they have. And we all watched when people stopped buying at Kmart. You know, it took them a while to die, but the parking lot got thinner, didn't it? And the shelves got a little barer. You could see that. And, and sometimes that's a sign that a business is in trouble. Sometimes we misread it. Right now, uh, Ross and TJ Maxx have less inventory than normal. How come? Well, a couple things. They, they did well over the holidays. The Christmas sales were good for both of those stores. And it's inventory time. So if you, and you ta you're taxed on your inventory, right? So if you can sell out your inventory and make your shelves a little bare, for a minute, while you take inventory, that's good for the store because now you're not paying as much tax-wise. Here in this town, um, the Red Cliff, where Outback Steakhouse is, all of those stores there and across the street are all owned by the same guy. Uh, and he's aggressive in, in the way he writes his leases. And his lease agreements, uh, your, how much rent you pay depends on your sales. And, uh, and in some cases, it's based on gross. In some cases, it's based on nets. Uh, the toy store that used to be there uh, left 100% for that reason. They have uh, more successful stores in uh, Vegas. Not that their sales were higher. These sales were super high here. That store was doing very, very well. Uh, but their rent was uh, predicated on their inventory and sales in a, in a formula. And uh, the landlord had put it in when they didn't think it mattered. And then it found out it was mattering. And it was making a big difference to the company. They finally said, well, we're sick of this. They couldn't renegotiate it, so they left. Uh, pulled that store, shut it down, and went elsewhere. And, and that can happen to our business, right, if we have things that are going weird like that. 
I don't yet know the story, but my understanding is a Paul Berger is closed. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it really just closed just a few days ago. I think. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. 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 And I don't know if that's. Um, this is a story that is an, uh, an example. We have a lot of these in St. George. We have a lot of companies here in St. George that are here because they've got a successful parent company in Salt Lake. And as Salt Lake businesses develop and are, are uh, successful, they'll open a store down here so they can come down here and go to Lake Powell, write it off, you know, and as the owners, and, and maybe it'll do okay too because they, 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 can, they can help feed it cash in the early days for it to start up. Um, and there's all kinds of businesses we could quote. There's warehouses, distribution businesses that are here because there was a successful store up in Salt Lake. Um, Triple T Heating and Air Conditioning. Small company with a few trucks, but they're quite successful up north. And based on that, it made sense to spill down into this market, right? And I'm, you know, and we, we have lots of businesses, and Apollo Burger is one of those. So what I don't know is how is Apollo Burger doing uh, on State Street? They got a store on State Street. They got one on North Temple. Uh, how are those stores doing? Are they closing them? We'll watch. And we'll see if it was an anomaly of rent, location. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with their product. I think the product has been fine. I personally like the pastrami on the hamburger. Uh, you can't get that at McDonald's, and I like that. Uh, and so they had a few things on their menu that, that uh, were unique enough and liked enough uh, by our community that I don't think that was a reason. Could be bad, man bad management. I do not know at this point. Either. And if we find out things, we might talk a little bit about that because we're learning about what goes right and what goes wrong. And did they lose their heads up? I mean, I don't know anything of the story behind that. I hate it though. I hate it when businesses have to exit. I hate it when they're not successful, especially if they're not successful for reasons that we could have fixed. And sometimes that's the case. You look at it and go, you know, that that bad customer service. They're hiring the wrong people and not training them. They can't be successful because they're front line doesn't have the tools they need to do well. That's management failure. And when a business fails on management failure, we can fix that, you know? And, and that's the wrong reasons for your business to go south. All right, um, before we watch the rest of that video, I wanted to uh, circle back to what uh, Brock had said, is how do you, and ask, how do you, how do you know how a company should perform? And I said, I ask accountants, because they do the books for places that are businesses, so sometimes they'll talk, and they'll tell you. They're, they're, they should never reveal, say, here, here, you want to see their, their, their financial statement? They should never do that. That's a breach of their, uh, what's called fiduciary uh, agreement. They're, your lawyer is not supposed to talk about your case. Your attorney uh, is bound. Uh, your accountants, if they're certified public accounts, are bound not to you know, publish your, your, your numbers on, on Instagram. You know, they, 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 are, they are supposed to keep secrets. And I don't want them to violate that. I just want a general idea a lot of times. Uh, how is that business doing? What, what's, you know, what kind of money are they actually pulling out of the business? Is it sustainable? Is it growable? You know, if they've got one successful store, could they have two? Um, and, and by the way, going from one to two is really hard. It's easier to go from one to three, and especially in the restaurant business. Um, and, and, and I'll explain that, is that when you go from one to two, you're introducing a new level of oversight management that's necessary. You have to keep your eye on both stores. And, and you're getting to the point where you need to hire somebody to do that. Because as an owner, you can no longer really actively shuttle back and forth between the, you build it with your hands, right? And so when you go to two, there's one you're not looking at. Uh, no matter where you're at, there's one you're not looking at. So you're at the point where you need to have a trusted person it thinks like you and, and works like you, and you've taught them and trained them to, to kind of be an extension of you, your eyes and ears. Well, the second store often can't afford to pay that extra overhead. So it takes three or maybe four to scrape off the amount of overhead for a general manager. And that's, that's a dilemma. Uh, you see it on a very, very real uh, version at a small uh, pizza store. You know, that it, it costs money to manage. And, and if you've only got one and the owner wants to stay, you know, on Lake Powell, having fun, um, 
they've got to have enough others that are that are making enough money to pay for the management or else they've got to sell or get back into themselves. And so this going from active to passive ownership and management is something that we will have to face as we develop the company if that's what our dream is. So all of that comes back to one uh, an answer to part of the answer to what Brock asked. There is something in the uh, United States and Canada that is a system of codes. And they have got a, they've kind of standardized this. Uh, everybody looks at this, Congress themselves looks at it. All businesses are stratified by a NAICS code. That's how it's pronounced. N-A-I-C-S. The North American Industry Classification System. And within every NAICS code, and that's, that's, that, that is for manufacturers, that is for gravel pits, that is for concrete companies, uh, wood, wood manufacturing companies, distributors of hardware, uh, distributors of software, writers of software, people that make games. Um, every kind of industry you can imagine has a NAICS code that best defines it. Consulting businesses, business that manage managing, uh, you know, management, uh, property management, those kinds of businesses have NAICS code. And why we need a NAICS code is so that the bank can say, let's look at another business like yours. But what is another business like yours? Well, I don't know. Uh, so this system allows us to code your business, and then the bank can start to compare your business to other businesses with the same code. And that makes sense, because those businesses are now similar to yours. They're not exactly alike but they're similar to yours. And, and so uh, you, would, you would gain those similarities. A, a warehouse club has its own NAICS code. I don't know what it is, but there's a website you can look it up. Uh, you, can, you can type in a kind of company and it will look it up. And if you, if you know, the big three in the US are uh, Sam's Club, the largest, and then a a toss-up between Costco and BJ's, depending on which coast. Uh, the East Coast is BJ's, West Coast is Costco. And those three businesses are definitely not exactly alike. You've probably visited all three of them. And there are uniquenesses about them. But they're the same, right? They, they charge you too much to join. Uh, uh, not true, but and they'll sell you some gas at a discount and it costs you 300 bucks every time you go, uh, or whatever it is. It's, you know, that's, that's kind of how they work. And, and it's a business model that is the same. And there are smaller versions of that all over the United States with the same NAICS code. So you wouldn't want to compare my little small one to Costco, because Costco is a big one. You know, they're the multinational. Uh, and so it, you'd want to compare my little business to another little business like mine if you, know, if you want to know if I'm managing well or if I'm not managing well. So NAICS codes is one of the things that we will look in and, and, and more. Uh, the next class, we're going to start to do ratio analysis. So we're, we're going to finish up on cash flow statements today, and we're going to look at ratio analysis. And the NAICS codes are going to be one of our pieces and sources of information. But I've copied for you, in today's handout, a four-page sheet that is current. And I have it because it's what I do. This, the next code here is agriculture-soybean farming. <clears throat> really? There's another one for corn farming. There's another one for alfalfa. So this NAICS code, if you see at the top, it's almost all ones, one, 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 zero. The NAICS codes go up to all nines. That's kind of how many kinds of businesses there are, tons of them. Um, but, but my family uses this and the corn one to make decisions about our tiny little farm in Illinois. So I want to know how is our farm comparing to everybody else? 
And this is a place where I can go to start to get that information from my mom. She's 93 years old, and she decides if we're going to rotate crops or we're not, or what we're, if we're going to use a new kind of fertilizer, if we're going to, we're going to do geo-surveying, uh, looking at uh, geo-testing uh, by, by almost by plant, uh, and, and, and all kinds of technology things that are reflected here in your profitability. Because they all cost money. Should we put tile in the field? Should we spend that uh, to drain out some of We get water in Illinois. you got to buy water in Utah. In Illinois, it just comes out of the sky. And if you get too much, it ruins a crop. And so you've got, and if it comes in the form of frozen water, it's hail, and you lose the whole crop, right? And so you've, you've got, should we insure that? Should we not insure that? All kinds of farming decisions that the farmer of 100 years ago didn't even have to think about. They have the same risks, but they didn't manage to that degree because the data wasn't available for us. Today, this data is available for us. And if you look, um, I'm going to kind of familiarize you, although we're going to dig into another, another NAICS code in another class, probably Tuesday, uh, maybe a week from today, Thursday. Um, but this one, you're not going to have to become farmers or anything, but I want to show you kind of how it's laid out. The very first page has the current data sorted by assets. And so by sorted by assets, what it means is there's, there's a column for small to big farms. And what you'll see on that column is very interesting to me. Um, there aren't any big ones. <laughs> They're all small farms in soybeans, anyway. Uh, and that's with A.E. Staley and a few other enormous soybean processors in the country, uh, they're not farming. They're huge companies, and they would be in one of the big columns here, but they're not farming. And it's also a, an indictment that the farmers aren't accruing the assets. They're leasing land. They're leasing equipment. Uh, a corn picker to pick our crop, $600,000. It's cool, but $600,000. You use it one time a year. You know, so... Should you lease that? Should you subcontract somebody that's already got one to use theirs? You know, these are business decisions that a farmer has to make. So here it is sorted by assets, and the smallest category is zero to $500,000 of, of assets. That's a very small time farmer. They only got 500,000 in assets. Most of our families have homes that are worth more than 500. Or properties, you know what I'm saying, and so so they may be leveraged and not 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 owned to the point where they don't show up as an asset on their balance sheet. So this is positive assets of zero to five hundred thousand, uh, five hundred thousand to two million, and two million to ten million. And this sheet says there aren't any farmers in the United States that are to speak of that are over ten million in assets. Okay, but all right, so that's the way it is. So we see. The top half of this sheet being a balance sheet, you see assets and liabilities. And then when you get to right about here, you start to see what's an income statement. You see their income data and their expenses, kind of what they are. So I know a soybean farmer uh, in these various categories, uh, in gross profit, the small farmer is making 94 percent. The little, the, the large farmer is making 82 percent. You see that? It's just, it's right there in the line. And you can see where you are from your financial statements based on where everybody else is at. So you can see if your numbers are in the same comparative rate uh, uh, comparison. Uh, further, uh, there becomes a lot of ratios. The bottom half of the page is all ratios. Uh, and we haven't talked about ratios yet, but we're going to talk about ratios next class. And this is that you can see the names of the ratios: your current ratio, your quick ratio, your sales versus receivable, your cost of sales versus inventory, your sales versus working capital, your EBITDA to interest, how much interest you're paying. You can see is it in in line with other farms like ours? And you'll see that from these ratios once we put pencil to it and start figuring them out. Um, in the Next page, you see th normally page one and page two in a book would be like this. 
So page one would be on the left, page two would be on the right. And I couldn't get the copy machine to print it out that way for me. Uh, so that's the way it is. And, and next, when we're doing this uh, with our pencil and paper actually looking at a company's financial statement, I've got a company in Las Vegas that is real data. And we're going to look at their real data. Uh, and, and right through COVID, in fact. Uh, so we'll see the impact of COVID on their startup. And, and, uh, and we will look at their, their NAICS data, and I will print it so that we can open it up and spread it out. So on the left side of the page is data sorted by assets. On the right side of the page, if you have it open like that, it's data sorted by sales. So you may have uh, high sales. I guess we don't need that right now anyway. Um, and, and then um, it, then page three and four just continues with more ratios. And it, it looks at, at cash flow things on the, on the fourth page, looking at change in cash one year to the next. And that's from your statement of cash flows. So we, will, we have balance sheet data here, we have income statement data here, and we have uh, comparative statements of cash flow data looking at changes from one year to the next with their business. The historical data columns go back uh, three years, I believe. Uh, 18, 19, and 20 in this case. Uh, nope, five years. 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. There's five years of historical data there uh, in the same categories. So you can see with the same companies. Now, how many companies did they actually look at? Uh, the people that sell this information have access to tons of it because it's the United States government. And then through agreement uh, the, with the company that I wrote on the board, RMA, uh, it stands for Robert Morrison Associates, they've had contracts to buy this data and resell it. Uh, one NAICS code costs 160 bucks from them. So once you don't, you don't, uh, you don't have the luxury of looking a lot of them, it costs too much money. Uh, I always worked in conf uh, uh, with one of our local banks. The banks usually subscribe to this service, so when you're asking for a loan, they'll pull out the data and look at your company versus others. There's two or three other services that have this. Amazon and Google are two of them, and they are, they are uh, in time, will probably create a new source of uh, more current uh, quick data information. Uh, and so I don't know 10 years from now if RMA will be the the source of this data that we buy. Uh, but I've used uh, uh, both Cash Valley and Zions for RMA data in the past, and whether they're continuing to subscribe, if they are, I may have to go other sources to get current RMA data uh, for companies. As, but it's worth 160 bucks if it's your company, you know, to know exactly what other people are doing. Uh, and, and we will walk through basically all the lines on this. So you know what these numbers mean. And, uh, and uh, uh, at first, it's just one of those things, I don't like columns and numbers, and I don't want to do the math and do it. But when it's my mom's farm, I'm compelled. I got to know. I got to know, are we, are we driving it right? Because that's her money. And it's our money it, collectively. Some of it's, you know, it's typical farms. She has owned some, I own some. I, brother owns some and you know it's 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 that's the way farms happen a lot of times but uh yeah you, you guys know exactly the drill on that and and uh, the more kids there are the blurrier it gets and and uh, uh aunts and uncles get involved sometimes too and really make it interesting but but managing them we all need access to data and so this is our source for access to data um, and I wanted to talk about that. We're going to look at statements of cash flow, but I think first let's finish up uh, our video that we were watching. No, let's not. Let's look at another di a different video before we look at statements of cash flow because I'm looking at when we want to take a break. And that'll give me the ability to find the right spot. So hang with me for a second. I want to look at This is a, a short one. This is just the right amount of time before we go to break, 11 minutes. Uh, and we're looking at just back to how to read financial, financial statements because that's our topic of what we're talking about these first 
uh, four or five classes of this course, and it's establishing uh, a, a, a fundamental basis for us. So how to read company financial statements by a different person. Uh, Part of analyzing a company for a potential investment is understanding their past, current and potential future financial situation. Unfortunately, a lot of investors skip past this part and focus just on the products and services the company offers and whether they feel that they have a good future or not. And we're not even talking about Wall Street bets, YOLO type investors either. We're talking about everyday investors who take unnecessary risks by not looking into the financial health of the companies that they're investing in. The most common reason for this is that they don't understand the financial statements. And that's quite understandable because they're full of numbers, strangely worded up, and can seem a bit confusing or complicated. But in reality, they really aren't so complicated at all and are nothing to be afraid of. In fact, once you know the basics, it can actually be quite interesting to dive into the financial statements of a company and analyze how the company is being run and any potential opportunities or threats that there may be. There are a number of different ways to analyze the financial statements, but before you get to that stage, you need to know how to read them so you know what it is that you're looking at. In this video, we'll go through the basics of a financial statement and explain the key sections so you can see how straightforward it really is. Now, as I'm sure you can see from the length of this video, we're not going to go into detail about absolutely everything, but we're just going to go through the main sections so you can get a good understanding. And in any case, most of the items, once you understand how these statements work, are pretty self-explanatory. They're actually labeled and you can figure out what it is that they're showing you. As an example for this video, we'll be looking at the latest quarterly results from Tesla. Now it's important to note that financial statements may differ slightly depending on the company or the industry or the country they report in. However, for US listed companies like Tesla, the financial statements would be included in the 10K and 10Q filings, which are mandatory for all publicly traded companies in the US by the SEC. The 10K is an annual statement and the 10Q is quarterly. The 10K will provide more information about the company and it is audited so the information you see in it will be more dependable and more accurate. Those audits are done by certified public accounting firms. If they miss audit, they lose their ability to do that. Uh, it's a you know, one and done, you're out uh, if you falsify an audit. The auditors are not on your team and they're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be arm's length third party auditors look at the financial statements. When I mean, you say these 20 people owe me money, they, the, an independent auditor, will contact all 20 and confirm that that in fact is true. Uh, and they, they will, if you say you've got an asset, they'll, they'll ask to come see it. Uh, they'll ask for a picture of it. And, and so it's, it's a very, it, it, the first audit that I paid for that was a uh, public company audit, we were a small company still, uh, but we were public, uh, the first audit cost $30,000. So that's the kind of money because of using a lot of time. It's in a big company, the audit costs are way more than that. And so, and that's the part, you gotta do it every year. Your quarterly statements do, don't, are sometimes unaudited, uh, depending on the firm. Sometimes they also get audited uh, on each of the quarterly statements. So, so you as an investor or a, 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 a employee of the company have more confidence that those numbers aren't lies they've been verified and vouched by a third party auditing firm. And they will write their opinion. Uh, and that opinion letter has to be part of a public company's financials that you get uh, as an investor or shareholder in the company. But let's take a look at what Tesla provided in its most recent report, which was for the first quarter of 2020. The financial statements for a company are usually made up of three main statements. We have the balance sheet, the income statement and the cash flow statement. The balance sheet is typically the first statement to appear and it gives a snapshot of the company's assets, liabilities and shareholders equity at a specific point in time. These three aspects make up what is known as the balance sheet equation, also known as the accounting equation. 
This states that assets are equal to liabilities and equity. The balance sheet is split into five sections. Current assets, non-current assets, also known as long-term assets, current liabilities, non-current liabilities, also known as long-term liabilities, and equity, which is also known as shareholders' equity or shareholders' funds. Let's start by looking at the assets. These will be listed in order of how liquid they are, which means how easily they can be changed or converted into cash. So, current assets are assets that are expected to be either used or sold within the next year. This will include things such as cash, cash equivalents, money owed by customers, inventory, and goods and services that have been paid for but not yet used. The non-current assets are assets that are not expected to be sold or used within the next year. Tesla includes things such as lease vehicles and solar energy systems, but there are also more common items also listed, such as property, plants and equipment, along with leases, intangible, in other words, non-physical assets, and goodwill. The next section shows the liabilities. Again, we have current liabilities, which are the obligations that are due within the next year. You've got to pause it for a second. Back there, uh, we had a brief conversation a couple of classes ago about goodwill, and they're showing it on their balance sheet. How do you prove that? How much goodwill does Burger King have in terms of the value of their business? It's an intangible. And they separate intangibles into a separate line from goodwill. Uh, intangibles, in their case, are things that you can't necessarily measure the uh, value of, of intellectual property or, or uh, you know, company know-how. You know, Coca-Cola has an intangible value in the recipe that it's not been revealed. We don't know how much actual cocaine is in Coca-Cola. Uh, at one time, there was a lot. Now, it's just <coughs> the leaves of the oak uh, that are in it. But we don't know how much, and they don't want us to know. Right? And, and, uh, and so that's an intangible value uh, of the company. But it would be arguable, wouldn't it? It would be, say, it's a guess how much it's worth. It's also a guess how much your goodwill is worth. So in the write-up that supports the financial statements in a public company, you, there are three financial statements. We just need to know what they are, but their annual report will be 100 pages. And in that 100 pages will be a lot of pages of notes to where they come up with those numbers at, telling you, <coughs> here's why we think this is what our goodwill is, is worth. And they'll have to have some commentary about that. They'll have to have something that you as a shareholder or as an investor are going to believe. And you're going to buy it. And you're going to say, okay, I, I agree. And when Warren Buffett invests in that stock, he's bought it too. You know, so that means that they've agreed that there's great value in the goodwill of the company. And a lot of advertising is spent at pumping up the value of the goodwill of the company. People believe that Bear River Car Insurance, which is one of the largest insurance companies in Utah, is not as good as GEICO. Because GEICO has pumped millions of dollars into their goodwill, the belief that they're a viable company. And that they are. They're a Warren Buffett company. They're a Berkeley Half. Uh, that's our company. Uh, they're real. They're good. But they keep pumping advertising, not just to get new customers, but to make us believe that they're the go-to company. Bear River, you've not heard of. But look them up, and you'll see that they're a large insurance company in Utah, not in the United States, but in, in our local market. And, and so they, the, 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 they don't have as much goodwill. We don't know who they are. But they may be a better insurance company. I don't know. Uh, you know, they, they, and so there are things that happen that build that go against our goodwill as our company. If we have a whole bunch of, of uh, malpractice suits against IHC and it keeps it in the newspaper, and we got people that are that are with their hair on fire going, "Hey, these people are creeps," that dings your goodwill, right? That 
subtracts from the value of the brand. That's what it's called, the value of the brand. And we all see that in other industries. You know, Dallas Cowboys has the highest goodwill in U.S. NFL teams. Uh, Manchester United has the highest good, the goodwill of the sports team in the world. And, and higher than any NFL team. Has nothing to do with anything other than perception, right? Goodwill in the case, if you're gonna approach Jerry Jones to buy the Dallas Cowboys, you're gonna fork out a ton of money for goodwill. And you'll back it up because that franchise is worth more than an upstart or a unsuccessful, a team that's never won the Super Bowl, if there are any, I don't know if there are, but you know what I'm saying. Teams that have been lousy uh, and, 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 and haven't had that success that the Dallas Cowboys have had, that is simply, and they're not having it this year, maybe. We, you know, we, don't, we don't know precisely what the end game's gonna be, right? And, and uh, so goodwill is something that, um, that is gotta be supported. Now, one other thing, when they talk about the accountant's equation, assets equals liabilities plus what? Equity. Equity, owner's equity, all right? So, we don't always determine our assets. You know, the value of our assets might go up, they might go down. In your little business, you've got, you're doing mobile mammograms, you're doing medical service, and you've got, you put an x-ray machine in a motorhome, in Winnebago, you take this Winnebago, convert it into a little clinical office on wheels, and you drive through the reservations in Arizona and, and uh, Utah, and, and, and uh, you offer a mammogram service, public service, and, and there's the, the Medicare pays for that, uh, tribal uh, coffers pay for that. You, you, the model works. Well, your one of your assets is that motorhome, right? What happens to motorhomes over time? Value of the asset goes. Yeah. Right now, brand new, beautiful motorhomes are 1.6 million dollars. Uh, they get down to 10,000, right? Uh, you can you can buy some right here, go hunting in them, and they're down to 10,000 dollars. Probably ones that don't run for less than that, right? And so the value of that asset's going down. So on your financial statement, as the value of the asset goes down, assuming your debt stays the same, what happens to owner equity? It goes down. Right? Because they have to stay equal. Your, your debt stays the same. The bank still wants all their money back. So as the asset value goes down, equity goes down. How much value the company is to the owner is now less because your assets reduced. Same, same thing as with your liabilities, right? So what I'm saying is you've got two of those numbers that you kind of have some control over maybe, and one of the numbers is just a result. The owner's equity is just a result. And if you want owner's equity to go up, then you've got to make the liabilities go down or the assets go up. You got no other choice. That's what you have to figure out how to do. And 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 sometimes you're lucky, and sometimes you, you're masterful in the way you make those two. If you're reporting equity to the public market or to your partner, your business partner says, "Well, I'm only going to keep doing this if we're get if we're growing in our equity. The company's worth more than it was." And so uh, that's part of the management game that uh, that we have to get masterful and have to figure that out. Uh, and this includes things like money owed to suppliers even money that has been paid, but the good or service is yet to be delivered, along with the portion of long-term debt that's due to be repaid this year. Then we have the non-current liabilities, which are obviously obligations that are not due within the next year. This includes long-term debt, and again, money that's received, but the good or service has not yet been delivered. The last section is equity which is often referred to as shareholders' equity or shareholders' funds. You can think of this as being whatever would be left over for shareholders if all assets were liquidated and all liabilities were paid off. Therefore, if the figure is positive, it means the company has enough assets to cover its liabilities. And if it's negative, it means that it doesn't. 
Shareholders' equity will include information about shares that were issued, any capital paid in by shareholders paying for shares in the company, and retained earnings, which is money accumulated from the company's earnings and kept in the company. The next financial statement is the income statement. This is also known by other names, including statement of operations and profit and loss statement, amongst many others. This statement is going to show us the earnings and expenses of a company over a specific period of time. This is important to keep in mind. The balance sheet was a snapshot at a particular point in time, whereas the income statement is looking at what happened over a specific period of time. So the income statement is helping us to see a company's financial performance for that period. Companies will structure the income statement differently, but listed companies like Tesla will typically follow what we refer to as a multi-step income statement, which separates the operating revenue and expenses from those coming from non-operating activity. So we're looking at gross profit, operating income or loss, the income or loss before taxes, and then the income or loss after taxes. To get to the gross profit, we typically look at total revenue minus the cost of that revenue. So traditionally here you'll have sales revenue and in the costs you may have heard of the term cost of goods sold. So this gives us the gross profit. We can then look at operating expenses, things like research and development for creating new products, selling general and administrative expenses, which are all the costs not directly involved in production of a product or service, but needed for the day-to-day -day business operations. This will include things such as rent, salaries for executives and other management expenses, admin staff, and basically any non-sales people. So ultimately, we end up with our income or loss from operations. Pause for a second. If I'm wilding wall beds, I have an interesting thing here. I can take, let's suppose we're looking at coming up with a, a new wall bed. We want to do bunk beds. You know, flip them up. There, you got them? We got them. Yeah, what a, okay. I, we I, got I, dog beds too. Okay, I've not seen it. You want to come up with another new product? I don't know what that other new product is. A, a, a water bed that comes out of the wall, okay? So, something that maybe we don't have yet. Um, and, and that is R&D. Product development is R&D. Now, how we expense R&D is a couple of, uh, there's a couple of things we can do. I can put it up here and burn it in, as an expense during cost of goods sold. I can bury the cost of, you know, I take a, a couple of guys and I say, you know, we're going to work on this new product, Andrew, you know, between things, you know, you got a full plate, we're going to just add one more thing, uh, see if you can figure out how to do this. And so we absorb R&D costs within our operating costs. And that's very commonly done. Uh, and, and we're burning that and it goes against our profits. So we're not, you know, we're not taxed on it. Uh, and and, and, and we've, we've got R&D being paid for by operations. That's awesome. There's nothing right or wrong about that. That's just an awesome way to report it. You can also, you see Tesla didn't do that. They didn't put it up here, they put it down here. Um, and we call that capitalizing your research and development. They put it on a, as a line item here, um, and, and they're going to they're gonna declare that elsewhere as an asset. They're going to say the, 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 the discoveries that they made are going to come out as because of R&D, we're going to come out as an asset. We haven't expensed it out. We've kept it separate, and we're going to we're going to when we finally launch it, we, it's going to, we're going to it'll show up on our balance sheet as an asset. And it's not wrong to do. You just can't do both. And and you're, it'll be a discussion with management. Is it better for us to capitalize our R and D and throw it in as an asset somewhere else that will that will make our that will make our financial statement look stronger to our bank, but it's foo foo us because they can't sell it yet. It's just, it's R&D costs, and it's not recoverable until you have an ongoing product that's gonna, that's gonna pay it back in some way. So this is something to look for uh, in, you know, if you got a partner in your company, where are they, where are they putting these, these things? Are they putting them where you think they ought to put them? Are they, are they putting them in a spot that's going to 
eventually make your balance sheet look artificially strong. We just want the truth, and we want to understand the truth. There's nothing wrong with R&D. In fact, you don't grow without innovation, right? And, and some R&D is wasted, because it turns out it never works. Uh, so it's an expense, it's a black hole uh, in some cases. Uh, and, and, and if, but if you report that as an asset uh, that's not yet recovered, that can stay on your, that's, that's false, it can stay on your balance sheet for a long time and, and mislead a lot of people. In a public company, that's dangerous to do. You go to prison for that if you get caught. Uh, but there are companies that do it all the time. And, and so you kind of have to discount uh, the, the way they have posted their, their, their stuff. And we're going to look into that a little bit as we analyze and break some companies apart. We're going to see how that is being done. I'm just planning to see right now. There was an example where it could be reported in one or two places. And neither one's right or wrong. Uh, you have to have a story behind it. Uh, and it has to be bought by all the We can then look at any interest paid or received to find our income or loss before taxes. And then finally, the income or loss after taxes. The third of the three major parts for financial statements is the cash flow statement. So the income statement that we just looked at may show us the profit or loss generated during a period, but that doesn't necessarily equal cash. A company will need cash to survive. So the cash flow statement is going to help us by giving information about a company's liquidity and solvency. Solvency means having enough funds or liquid assets to make necessary debt payments and fund the company's operations. If the company runs out of cash, it could be insolvent, which is one of the main reasons for businesses failing. The cash flow statement will tell us the amount of cash or cash equivalents coming into the company or leaving the company, therefore showing us how much cash is on hand for a company to make its necessary payments. The cash flow statement is usually split into three main sections. Cash from operations, cash from investing activities, and cash from financing activities. The first section shows us the cash flow from the primary revenue generating activities of a company. So this includes the company's products or services, things like cash from sales, rent payments, salary payments, and so on. Cash flows from current assets and current liabilities. Next are the cash flows from investing activities. The focus here is on acquiring or getting rid of long-term assets. This will show us outflows due to investments made in things like property and inflows when assets are sold. However, this statement doesn't detail the investments and so the quality of those investments can't really be assessed. And finally, we have the cash flow from financing activities, which shows us cash coming in or going out due to any equity capital or borrowings. It tracks cash flow between the company, its owners, creditors and lenders, including stockholders. So there you have it. Simple, wasn't it? Those are the main sections of the three main statements that make up a company's financial statements. The balance sheet, the income statement and the cash flow statement. Now we didn't go into lots and lots of detail. This was a high level overview, but just by understanding those main sections, and how the statements are laid out and how they relate to each other and the jobs that they do, you can already get a good grasp of what's going on in the company and you should now be able to read a company's financial statement and understand what you're seeing. I'd recommend downloading the financial statements of companies from different industries and seeing how they differ from one another and whether you can read them now and get a better understanding of what's going on in those specific companies. And if you like this video and want to see more on this topic, such. So you saw from what he laid out from Tesla there, uh, and, and I posted that on Canvas, by the way. That is not the most current. That was 2020. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I posted the uh, least the latest annual and the last quarter, uh, which was September 31, on Canvas. And so you can look at it and see. Uh, it's a lot more than three pages for three financial statements. It's, it's 100 pages or 80 pages or something with a lot of discussion uh, and some of it's very interesting because a whole piece of that is forward-looking one of their jobs is to create a compelling future to their partners to their shareholders to their 
their uh, their suppliers uh, and to uh, us you know so they they want to say we're a good company with good stuff and and here's why this is what's coming out like you you were talking about AMD at the beginning of class that you bought their stock because they announced in in Vegas at CES certain things that there were products that are coming out and and that's that's in an annual report that's the statement of the future this is what this is why we're optimistic about our company. This is what we're thinking that we we've got that's going to wow the world, and and this is the this is what you're investing in if you invest in the company, and you'll reap some of the benefits of that. Uh, and and in all, I've i there's a rumor that AMD might split, and and stock split we haven't talked about yet. Uh, if one of that happens, one of the holdings that you are doing in Investopedia, uh, we will talk about it then. Uh, let me know if one of yours splits. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes that's a surprise, and sometimes uh, the market is aware, like I said, there's a rumor, and sometimes the market is aware that a company is going to go public or a company is going to split, or, and, and that might have an impact. You know, when, when uh, 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 Tesla was looking at buying TikTok, there were prices, right, you know, that were, that were rumored around, the share price of what it would be, uh, if the if the sale was approved by Congress, and uh, uh, and that changed a few times. So if you invested based on that, you might have come out ahead. You might come out behind because it wasn't a fact yet. In investing on a rumor, and uh, so that's an interesting thing. We were talking about that at a later point in time. We're going to take a break in a second. Um, we had a activity we did in class uh, last class, and I want to uh, follow through on that and. Maybe when we come back uh, from break, we'll, we'll watch the remaining piece of the video we didn't watch, and then we will go to uh, introducing the people that you interviewed. Now, our population's changed a little bit. A couple people are here that weren't here, and so didn't get to interview uh, anybody and weren't interviewed by anybody. And we have uh, three or four people that are traveling or are not here. Uh, one is sick, and so we may person that interviewed you may not be in a room, uh, and so we're, 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 we're going to have to do a little bit of uh, flex uh, on that. I, I want us to come back uh, from break after we watch the, the remaining piece of that video. I want us to follow through on introducing the persons that we interviewed, uh, and if you weren't here, the interview was to find out a uh, name, where the person works, uh, if money was not an object and they could go anywhere in the world they wanted, where would it be? and why, and finally, what is their plan for retirement? And, and uh, I want that last piece to convert into a homework assignment. I would like each of you to write a, a minimum of a paragraph uh, of your retirement plan. And I want to convert that into something that you put more thought into. That will be private between you and I. Uh, I won't share that with anyone else. Uh, and. Um, because uh, it remains your business, not mine, uh, or anyone else's. And it's not a contract in concrete. It's just what you plan. The plan is a plan. And, and why I'm asking you to write it down is that hope, which we all have, hope is not a plan. Uh, and and uh, so at least while luck, luck's not a plan either, uh, but while luck and hope uh, play into what happens in our lives uh, going forward, I want you to at least have some thought process of where are you going to be in 50 years financially? You know, or peel that back a little bit. 30 years, 25 years, 10 years. Kind of what is the plan so that you can be where you, where you would want to be at, at some point in your life? Uh, our financial needs change, our financial world changes, our families change. I know that you can't be exact on this, but I would like you to do that, and I'd like that to be due a week from today, so you've got a week uh, to do that assignment. You can post it, uh, uh, turn it in under assignments on Canvas. You can uh, email it to me or attach it to a text uh, to me, or you can hand me a hard copy. Uh, you choose how you want to do it. Uh, but get me a copy. I will. Uh, that will be one of the check marks that's a, a, a recorded assignment that you did do or didn't do in this class. So I'd like everybody to participate and do it. Uh, I'm not going to judge it as to whether it's a great one, great plan or a lousy plan. Uh, if you've got questions about it, I'll talk about it if you'd like, privately. Uh, and um, 
I got nothing to sell. <laughs> there's, no, there's no objective here at all other than for you to start the thought process or, or take it to the next step uh, in your personal game plan uh, as you are. Uh, we all uh, have to answer that at some point in time. And, you know, committing a felony and going to prison the last few years of my life I, might be a good health care plan. It might be a good meal plan. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, 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 it might. Uh, but it also might not be. So uh, it, it, we've got all kinds of options. Escape down island in the South Pacific. Maybe that's the plan. Uh, that might be cool, or it might also not be cool, depending on typhoons, you know. So uh, that I, I, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, have you at least take thought about the next step. Take a break right now, ten minutes. I'll see you. We'll spool up and watch, finish that video, and then you'll introduce the person you interviewed. If you didn't interview anybody, you will introduce yourself. So they have it up above, and it, so they don't care about the chemicals that the water gets through it. I guess they have, so they're like, I put down mouse traps, birds, and everything that I catch birds and mouse traps throughout. But they have to do that. But I guess a bunch of frogs going to swim, so they're going to show up. There's frogs swimming in the pool, so they always want to close no matter what. So I got to like pump it and then like bring the water to here and then go and pump it again. So just if it rains, that's what I'll be doing, but that's what I think. I, I, yeah, I get it. It's, you know, I, it, like I said, it has to be an automated, because if you figure out a solution to that, that's a rich man's product. Yeah. There's a lot of them out there. Yeah. And you figure out a way to, you know, blow it off with a big blower or something, I don't know, moisture sensor. I should, no, I should do that. See, so yeah, I got to come up with a solution. I have a blower at the other house. I have a backpack blower, so before they come yeah. down, I do that. But I got a little handheld one I'll use before they come down, they have two homes down there. But maybe I just, uh, that's a good idea. I should actually try that. I'm going to bring the backpack. Well, water <laughs> gathering on top of a pool cover? Is a solution for that? Mm -hmm. I would assume you could have a pressure sensor that senses when there's pressure placed upon the top of that, and then you just have a pump that you know what functions I on top to of it. In your case, because they probably would not ever really notice it, poke a hole in it. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. They used to have it cracked and frogs in it, but no, the blowers are good. I'm going to go tell my carpenter manager. I didn't think about that because I have a really good, like, 40, yeah. 46.2 cc I one. Did. Maybe I can just go over and go. It's like 200 bucks. It does, like, okay gallons per minute. So I got to stick it probably 30 minutes <laughs> and then kind of move the water and then go and do that. But maybe I just fire it up and just go. Yeah. Yeah, when it ran a few times, I went, they're like, yep, some of them a few times. Yeah, I right. just didn't oh, yeah, yeah. a problem. Yeah, <laughs> so. <laughs> Rich man, problem, poor man, solution? The only issue is a lot of their jobs require 
or they're, they're asking for degrees from schools, engineering degrees, because I don't know. Well, I don't know how much that is negotiable. You yeah. Know, most of the time with most companies, it's negotiable. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll just pretend to be uh, resume that could indeed fill through, right? Is you a while to collect the cash? Well,
That's a good idea. I'm going to try that next time. <laughs> it might just take five minutes instead of like half an hour. So. And as far as the hole is concerned, that could be a hole that's with a plug in. Yeah. I mean, it could be a hole that you just pull a string and pull pops out and want to put it back yeah. in. And I like the innovation. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a rich man's problem that, that you ought to be able to solve and make some money on. Yeah. Because they're not the only ones. <laughs> and one of those two houses, what, probably six million together? Maybe one. Maybe probably. more. Maybe, maybe no. More. Maybe just the one in Northridge, but um, the okay. Cachino one's probably a couple. Of, um, <laughs> those, those are expensive houses. Yeah. Well, one doesn't have a pool cover, but the one does. So I guess you know they don't really get like mice and birds and lizards and all that stuff. It's more out by a trot by the other one where they're having the frogs and pool. Drop off so. some feral cats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. I set up mouse traps and it catches birds. So. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Mouse trap catches birds. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to watch the end of this video, and then when that is over, I'm going to I'm going to replay the last couple minutes where he first started about guessing uh, the Apple uh, or guessing the financial statement rather. And, and while the video is going, if you like to multitask and and uh, want to play on your phone for one thing, I'll, I'll point in one direction. Apple stock is AAPL, is one of the uh, forms of their stock, the most common one. Uh, Google is G-O-O-G-L, and Microsoft is M-S-F-T. Uh, those three companies have a lot of cash right now, a lot of cash. And so if yeah, you had, Christmas is over, we just everybody shipped them a lot of cash <laughs> and <laughs> sent it right to them. Uh, look up if you want. Uh, there you will get different numbers depending on the day because remember cash is either comes from a statement of cash flows where you can see it there. You can also see it as an asset, cash on the end. Uh, but you were looking at cash and liquid investment, so we're looking at, at current uh, assets would be a place that you can find it. Uh, journalists will write about it and they'll report it. Uh, look at their reference, what their reference is, make sure they're not just making it up. Uh, but I'd like you to come up with some various numbers of cash that Apple, Google, and Microsoft has. I'll uh, we'll talk about that briefly uh, today and a little bit more later, um, a lot more later, because cash is king. And one of the things we're looking at at a company is cash. One of the things investors in your company are going to look at is how you're managing cash. And if you run out of cash, you're out of business. That's just the way that is. And so cash is something we have to manage and allocating the cash Remember, this guy already told us that's one of the key things we have to do as a CEO is cash allocation. We have to drive the business, yes, but we have to uh, drive the uh, proceeds of that business, and that's in our that's on our desk. That's our job. So let's pick up here. Um, be ready to introduce your uh, the person you interviewed as well. And, uh, I'll wait. We'll be done with and then you have to pay for the hammer. That sounds like operations. It's really finance, Wally. Okay, I'm going to show you one more company and give away one more book. Here we go. This is going to be really hard. Last time you had like a one in six chance, uh, a shot of getting it. Now it's like one in 5,000. I'm going to show you a picture. You just have to tell me what company it is. And there's like 5,000 or 10,000 choices. Okay, here we go. This is 30 years of data. I'll just walk you through the colors and you just tell me what this is. So. This is just that mundane stuff. You're like, this isn't finance, except it really is. So the red line, I'm um, sorry, no, let's do uh, the green line is how much inventory they hold. Used to be like 60 days of inventory, it's now three. Okay. The red line is how quickly they collect from their customers. Used to be 60, now it's 20. And the purple line is how long they take to pay their suppliers. Used to be 40, it's now 120. You have a one in 10,000 chance. Take 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you. What company is this? This is ridiculous, but you got the last one right, so. Sorry, and that last line, the blue line, is the working capital, the net of those three, Wally. So they used to have positive working capital, and now they have huge negative working capital. So it's just the difference between those three things before, it's kind of now it's flipped. The time they take to pay somebody is far longer than the time they 
uh, need their cash for. All right, let's do this. Gentleman in the Argyle sweater. It is not Procter & Gamble. It is not. It, they would not, they would look somewhat similar, but they haven't done anything so dramatic. Well, a lot of people don't. But who is this? This is somebody very distinctive who I think somebody's going to get. Only we, we don't want to have 10,000 guesses. So if you're feeling confident, in the back, right there. Yes. It is not Walmart. They've made changes in this direction, but nothing so dramatic. Who is this? No clues, come on. You, this is like that, there's a book at stake here. Yes, you are. Sorry? It's not Coca-Cola. I think this is simpler than you think it might be. The problem with this company is people don't admire it for this. They admire it for other stuff. But it turns out this is like what you should be admiring about this company. Yes, right here on the aisle. This is Apple. Indeed. This is Apple. This is what you should be admiring about Apple, not its iPhone 11. What have they done over the last 30 years? They have transformed themselves. How did they do it? First, they went into retail. That means you collect really quickly from your customers. Look at that inventory. They went into retail and they operate with three days of inventory. That is absurd. How do you operate a retailer with three days of inventory? Where is all the inventory? When you go to New York to the new Fifth Avenue store and you say, can I have the new MacBook, will it be there? Yeah, it'll be there. How do you operate a retailer with three days of inventory? Sorry, you are Jason, send me an email, I'll send you a book. Jason, how do you run a retailer with three days of inventory? Just in time, where is all the inventory, Jason? I'm sorry? Sorry? On site, it's not in the store. It's not on Apple's balance sheet. It's with the suppliers. What does Apple do every night on Fifth Avenue? They call up Foxconn and they say, I'd like a thousand MacBooks at 7 a.m. in the morning. And what does Foxconn say? Yes, sir. And then what does Apple say? I'll pay you when I feel like it. And what does Foxconn say? Yes, sir. This is what Tim Cook built. This does not happen by accident. It is an incredible financial model. And it's using cash. It's using suppliers to finance themselves. It does not happen by accident. And it's about generating operating cash flow far in excess of profits. That's why they're sitting on piles of cash. Okay, it also helps explain why they have a beautiful balance sheet. Let's just take a look at the Apple balance sheet so you can appreciate the finance perspective. This is a very simplified version of their balance sheet. I'll just walk you through quickly. You tell me what's beautiful about it. They have net cash of around 130 billion. Actually, they have a lot more cash. You take out the debt, that's their net cash. They got equity of 118. They got total assets of 374. They got total liabilities and shareholders of 374. Operating assets have got to be 244. Operating liabilities have got to be 256. Anybody see anything amazing in this picture? This should bring a tear to your eye. What's beautiful about this picture? Take 20 seconds, just talk to the person next to you. What's beautiful about this picture? Look at the symmetry and see if you see, an, uh, if, see if you see a beautiful symmetry. Okay, so let's go to the symmetries. One possible symmetry is, some people look at the cash number and they're like, oh, that looks a lot like the equity number. That's interesting. Other people look at the operating assets and see it's the same number as the operating liabilities and they say, that's interesting. Some people look at the totals and they say they're the same and that's interesting. <laughs> that's not interesting. In fact, I think the interesting thing is not that cash looks like equity. The interesting thing is that operating assets look like operating liabilities. Why is that beautiful? What does that mean? It means there's no debt, that's for sure, but it means more than that. Operating assets are the same as operating liabilities. What does that mean? They could handle a downturn. That should really bring a tear to your eye. What does that imply? Yes, I shut up. I'm sorry? 
their liquidity is good. It implies more than that. Here's what it implies. They don't need any capital from outside to run the business. The capital intensity of this business is negative. That's a beautiful thing. They don't actually use external capital. That's amazing. That's an incredible financial model. That's why this is what Tim Cook built. How did he do it? You outsource everything, and then you run your suppliers ragged, and you push them hard. If anyone's ever been a supplier to Apple, it is miserable. They've been accused of bankrupting their suppliers. They run roughshod over them. And you get a beautiful economic model that looks like this, which means you use nobody's external capital, which is amazing. Okay, let's do a couple more things, and then we'll give away one or two more books, and then we'll pause. The next big question in finance is, where the heck does value come from? It's like the biggest question in the world. What is value? Where does it come from? Turns out there are pictures like the one on the left. That's Apple. Turns out there are pictures like the one on the right. That's Avon. It's a lot of value creation. It's a lot of value destruction. How does that happen? So finance has got a simple answer to that. Okay, where does value come from? Am I creating value? It's like the biggest question in life. What's the finance answer to that? Let's play a little game to see if we can do it together. By the way, sometimes it looks kind of like in the middle. This is BP. Are they creating value? I don't know. So let's play a little game to talk about where value comes from. This will be even harder, but you did well when you had one in 10,000 chance, so uh, I have faith. Here comes a little exercise. This will be really hard, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of the big ideas of finance in a, in a simple way. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple of facts, and here's what you have to tell me. We're gonna talk about finance versus accounting. There's this thing called book value. That's accounting. What does that mean? How much money did you put in? Now there's this thing called market value. That's finance. What does that mean? Look into the future, tell me what you're worth today. Okay? We're gonna compare those things in something called a market to book ratio. Market value over book value. Finance over accounting. Okay? Here we go. This is gonna be really hard, but it's gonna get better. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a couple of things. You're gonna put $100 into this business. The return on capital is gonna be 20%. You're gonna do it for 10 years, and then you're gonna liquidate it, and you're gonna give the money back. And then finally, you're gonna keep half the money in the business, and you're gonna pay out half. Everybody understand? Basics of the business? Everybody okay? Okay, all you have to do is tell me what's the market to book ratio. Here's the good news. There's only four choices. So you have a one in four chance. First choice, the market to book ratio is bigger than one. Second choice, the market to book ratio is equal to one. Third choice, the market to book ratio is less than one. Fourth choice, I don't know, why did I come here tonight? I didn't know there was gonna be a quiz. Everybody understand the choices? Greater than one, equal to one, less than one, I don't know, okay? Let's try to get um, participation rates in this vote greater than typical American electoral participation rates, more like Canadian electoral participation rates. So let's see if we can do this. Everybody has to vote. Okay, ready? Greater than one. Smattering. Equal to one. Slightly smaller smattering. Less than one. Similar kind of smattering. I don't know. Get me out of here. Fantastic. Sorry, you are, you said I don't know. Indeed. You need the book. Actually, you probably don't, because you have the right answer. Why is the right answer, I don't know? You have a great intuition. Not enough information. You are Fiona, what's missing? You don't know the answer to this, because you don't have enough information. Fiona, what's missing from this little story? Not everything, just one thing. You, risk, always a good thing to say in finance. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You're, who said risk? Risk, always a good thing, yeah. And in particular, the thing we're missing is a discount rate. To think about value, you need a discount rate. What does that mean? What do we do in finance? We look into the future. You have all the information about the future. What you don't have is the risk penalty that you apply to those future cash flows to bring them back to the present. That's the essence of value. Okay. 
now you have a discount rate. This is really hard, but I think if you get this intuition, it's a big idea and you'll walk away with a big idea tonight. Okay, so here we go. Now there's only three possibilities. You can only vote for one of three things. You can't say I don't know anymore. So are you are? What is the weighted cost of capital? What does he mean by that? When he talks about discount rate, what does he mean by that? It means that What, what has happened? Has inflation happened or deterioration happened? What is going to happen? You know, that, that million dollar house in ten years might need a new roof. San Bernardino 10 years ago was a $100,000 house, right? And, and it's not a very nice house now at a million. Not that San Bernardino is a bad place, but put that house in Compton. There weren't any million dollars. At one point, time or something else on the ocean. So, so we don't know what's happening in the future. That, and there's a what's what interest rates. In my lifetime, I have seen household, not household, home loan interest rates go from half a percent to seventeen and a half percent, back to two percent, and I don't know where they're at now, but five and climbing, right? And so. What is the cost of money? That's the cost of money, basically, for us to buy a house that we live in. We need a discount rate to project what that's going to be. How much is it going to deteriorate by? And they're discounting it by 15%. That's what they're doing, looking into the future. Is that right or wrong? Don't know. But it's at least throwing a number in, so we now can look at how do we create value in our company. If we don't create value in our company, we can't cash out. Our, if we don't own the company, somebody does. We have to be creating value so that the future market is worth more than our historical market has been. The company has more potential. And if you look, if you're an excavating company today, the, the big excavating companies today were the little excavating companies 10 years ago, and some of them didn't exist. And some of the ones that did exist are gone, right? And, 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 and that's true of every industry, is that, that, that what is the discount on our business? And if, if, if it's not there, why are we there? Why are we working? You're just giving me a paycheck? I'm adding no value. If it's my company, I want my company to be worth more in some years than it is now. And what it is now is based on book value of what it was and what it is now is based on market value of what it will be. I want that market value to be more than what it was. Does that make sense? I'm going, I want it to be greater than what? So let's hang on to that thought. Bar, Fiona, so Fiona this time, no more, I don't know. Is the market to book ratio bigger than one, equal to one, or less than one? Everybody ready to vote? By the way, participation rates in the voting last time were pretty American not terribly Canadian, so let's try to get them a little bit higher. Here we go. Who says it's bigger than one? A little bit more? Equal to one? One or two? Less than one? Bunch. Fantastic. Anybody want to explain? Who said bigger than one? In the red sweater? Sorry, right there. Yes, you? You want to explain why? So the return on investment is higher than the, than the cost of capital. That's all you needed? That's it. You are Isabel. Fantastic, Isabel. Let's take a look at Isabel. This is the spreadsheet that you can build this weekend with your loved one. You do that, what do you do? Oh, you make 20% every year. You pay out half, Isabel. You discount it back at 15%. You put the money back that's left, you do it again, and 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 you do it again. And at the end of the 10 years, you have the present value of all those future cash flows. That's today's value. And you're right, Isabel. It's greater than one. Fantastic, Isabel. Let's do it again. Everything's the same, except now the return on capital is 15. 20 seconds, talk to the person next to you. Greater than one, equal to one, less than one. 20 seconds, what is the market to book ratio going to be? 20 seconds, talk to the person next to you. This is going to get, this is hard, but actually I think there's going to be a payoff to it. This is really, really hard. Anybody got a good feeling about this? 
greater than one, equal to one, less than one, the market to book ratio is going to be, give it a shot. Sorry, you are in the black turtleneck, yeah. Sorry, Martin. It's greater than one, why? So it's greater than one. Fantastic. Anybody want to disagree? Anybody want to disagree? Just right in front of the jacket? Less than one. Why? Half of it. Fair enough. Anybody want to put the last thing up? Which is, it's going to be equal to one in the back. Yes. Yes, you. Sorry, you are? Sorry? Tiffany. So what do you, what's the answer? Equal to one. Sorry? They balance each other out, Tiffany. 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 Tiffany, the market of ratio will be one. Will it be 1.0000000, Tiffany? Yes, it will be, <laughs> Tiffany. And this is the harsh logic of finance. You think you're a king or a queen because you've got a 15% return, and what does finance say? Eh, you could have stayed in bed. The world is no better for you. That is the harsh logic of finance. One last time, return on capital is 10%. Everything else is the same. Tiffany, what's the answer gonna be? Less than one. Not Tiffany, you could have stayed in bed, Tiffany. You should have stayed in bed, Tiffany. This is the harsh logic of finance. Okay, if we understand this, we should be able to do this final little game and then we can um, pause. Here's the final game. This will be really, really hard, but I have faith in you now. And especially Tiffany. Tiffany, I know this is hard to see. Here's this entire table. We're gonna vary the return on capital. Those are the columns. We're gonna vary how long you do this for. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. And then we're going to vary how much of the earnings are reinvested. 30%, 70%, or 100%. Everybody understand the basic configuration? Okay. All you have to do is the following, and you win a book. Where's the highest market to book ratio? Where's the lowest? And will there be any more Tiffany's? Tiffany's are 1.0000. The discount rate is always 15%. This is really hard. But if you get this, you walk away with a big lesson from finance about where value comes from. Take 20 seconds. We need the highest market to book ratio, the lowest market to book ratio, and are there any Tiffany's? And a book is on the line. You have to get all three questions right. Take 20 seconds and talk to the person next to you and try to figure it out. All right, let's do this. Anybody feeling it? And how many earnings are reinvested? So all the way on the bottom right, you say it's gonna be the highest. You are, Mark, where's the lowest number gonna be? All the way in the bottom left. And will there be any Tiffany's? All the 15's are Tiffany's. No matter what, it's Tiffany. All the way down. Fantastic, how do we feel about Mark? Mark, that is fantastic, exactly right. What is this telling us? Where does value come from? Tiff, Mark, where's the really exciting stuff? You beat your cost of capital. That's Isabel, 25 versus 15. But you don't do it for one year or two years, Mark. That's not interesting. You have to beat your cost of capital for 30 years. Then it gets exciting. And Mark, what's really exciting? You redeploy all those earnings inside the company at that higher rate of return. Now you're talking about 12X value creation. That's wonderful, Mark. What's the disaster? The bottom left, Mark. You're not beating your cost of capital. You're doing it for 30 years. You're doing something stupid. You're doing it for a long time. Oh, and then by the way, we're gonna keep the money in the company and just keep doing stupid stuff. That's massive value destruction. And Tiffany, it doesn't matter because nothing matters in Tiffany's world. Keep it in, take it out, do it more, do it less, do it for longer, do it for shorter. Nothing matters because you're in Tiffany's world where you can just stay in bed. That's the essence of value creation, which is a way of saying finance has a very simple recipe for value creation. 
it is what? You gotta beat your cost of capital, Isabel. If you're not beating your cost of capital, it's it, that's it, it's game over. Second, you gotta do that for a long time. And third, you gotta grow. And by the way, finance is no different than strategy. Finance and strategy are the same. You gotta beat your cost of capital. What do we call that? Product and process innovation. You gotta keep that gap open a long time. What do we call that? Patents, brands, barriers to entry. And then finally, you gotta grow if you want the real value creation stuff that you think matters in life. Okay, and of course, um, that's kind of showing up when you look at a company like BP, who used to beat their cost of capital and no longer does. I won't do this too much, but it's from the previous book. The previous book is a way of saying that recipe of value creation is actually inherent in the human condition. This is the parable of the talents from the Bible in the book of Matthew. It's a story which basically has the same recipe for value creation and leading a good life that we teach in finance. The stories that come out of finance are not some alien thing coming out of portfolio theory in the last 30 years. They're deep in the human condition. And that's one example from that book. Okay, I've already gone way too late. Um, capital allocation is, I think, just like free cash flow, a dominant frame on the way businesses run themselves today. Wasn't even showing up on conference calls 30 years ago. What is capital allocation? It's actually really simple. What are you gonna do with all that free cash? Answer number one, you keep it. Answer number two, you pay it out. If you keep it, what are you gonna do? Organic or inorganic? You pay it out, what are you gonna do? Dividends or buybacks? What's been the pressure for the last 10 years? Everybody's migrated down to the bottom. Buybacks, buybacks, buybacks. Like you wouldn't believe all around the world. That's either a fantastic deployment of capital or one of the great tragedies of modern capitalism. This looks simple. Bill Ackman is basically telling you all you have to do right is get this right. You don't have to do anything else right to be a good manager. Why is it so hard? Well, it's pretty simple actually. If you got positive NPV projects, what does that mean? Are you creating value? Just like we talked about. You keep it. If you're not, you don't. Do you build or buy? And similarly, do you pay it out as a dividend or a buyback? Here's why it gets really hard. It turns out there's tons of pathologies involved in this, which is it's actually really hard to get right. And most of modern management is about trying to get this right. And according to Ackman and according to many, that's what a manager does today. They allocate capital and that's all they have to do well but that means internalizing a lot of the lessons that we've been talking about. Okay, I'm already over time. I won't do this last piece, uh, except to say, uh, well, let me just show you, this is actually the new book, which is about the way this investor capitalism arose and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and about how that happened. We can talk more if you're interested. And then finally, hopefully what you take away from this, most people think finance is about money it's not. Finance is about the hardest problem of modern capitalism, which is that picture that we started with. And it turns out it's all about information and incentives. Everything that you see in finance is a reaction to that information and incentive problem. And once you put that front and center, everything else becomes more clear. There are the numbers of great ideas that are there, ideas around where value creation comes from, ideas about the way you kind of capture economic returns, um, and the ideas of capital allocation. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taste of the book and it gives you a little taste of what finance is. Most of all, what the book endeavors to do and hopefully what you take away from today, even though it was very tough, is many people are intimidated by finance and that's because people in finance like to intimidate you. The ideas in finance are actually very transparent. They are not rocket science and they're actually quite intuitive. And hopefully for the rest of your life, people won't be able to intimidate you because that is a very hard way to live. And there's nothing in finance that is particularly complicated, any more complicated than what we just did uh, tonight. All right. Um, we will talk more about those principles They're in the book, the textbook. And um, I will copy those last four graphs that uh, he shared with us there because I would venture that most of the owners of the businesses you work for 
are not readily aware of what their cost of capital is right now. The exception might be the CEO of Costco. And that's an indictment on us. We can all know it by looking at our financial statements and looking at our operating cash flows. We can know where that's at. And when you look at that table, uh, it's really kind of interesting that uh, you gotta make money and it's gotta be profitable. You gotta make more than, you know, buy low and sell high. That's true of wood, stain, people, everything you've got in your business, you have to make money or it doesn't make sense. And you have to keep doing it for a long period of time and you have to know where you stand. Otherwise you can keep doing it and it's, it will end you up badly. I remember personally having a conversation with Jim Andrews at Andrews Transportation a long time ago. And we were trying to you know, strengthen the company, uh, grow it, build it, uh, a, a family company, not a public company, a family company that was being groomed to hand on to other family members. The founders of the company, Bill and Jim Andrews, twin brothers, uh, are both dead now. Uh, they both built a company that still exists. Uh, they've got 130 trucks on the road right now, uh, give or take, I don't know the exact number. Uh, but I remember when we had gone through their financials and had, had labored over the numbers, I remember having a conversation with him when I said, Jim, do you realize that every time you send a driver on this run, and it was a hay cube run, picking up hay cubes in Enterprise and running it down to Long Beach Port to ship to Japan, hay cubes that were going, uh, they had loads going every day, They'd come back, they'd stop, they'd pick up a load in, in LA and bring it to Vegas, and in Vegas they'd pick up Pepsi or something and bring it here, and, and they tried to get a backhaul on that load, but they were losing money on that load at that time. And they were paying drivers $1.35 a mile, it sticks in my mind, I don't remember what the, the number was at all, but they were losing money per mile, and when I said, you realize that every time you send a driver on that run, you are writing him an additional check of this amount. We figured out what it was. That's how much he was losing. The driver wasn't making it. The company was losing it at that point in time on that run contract. And, and that's not okay. And that's not private information anymore. That was enough years ago that it's of no consequence now. Uh, they have managed to, to pay a million dollar a week fuel bill, a diesel fuel. They, they've managed to stay in business and grow. And Jim's son, Jimmy, is running the business, and he learned a lot from his father. And, and he, he changed a lot of things from the way they had been running the business. Looking at the numbers, not looking at the loads. Looking at what is actually driving the company are these numbers. Knowing their cost of capital. Should they buy a brand new uh, Volvo truck? Or, it, or, or when should they sell? Should they rebuild the engine? You know, trucks will go a million, million and a half miles uh, without a rebuild, and after a rebuild, uh, they become dump trucks or something. I don't know what they become. <laughs> the, we put more miles on them. They'll go a lot of miles. But at what point in time should you trade in a $200,000 truck? And there's a number that gives you the number. For them, it was at 400,000 miles. When it had a lot of life left in it, it had a lot of value left in it. And so figuring out those things, that's how you know and can calculate the cost of capital because they know what they have to keep plowing in. And, and the determination there to reinvest, how many business owners around us do we know are not doing the reinvestment part? They have a lifestyle business where they're working on the business to take cash out of the business to go play. There's nothing wrong with that but recognize it that you're not creating value. Recognize that you're burning up a resource that may not be there to pass on to your children. But you've had fun. That's a fine an answer. You know, that's not wrong to do that. But it's wrong to not know you're doing that. It's wrong to not understand uh, what we're building or not building in our business. Now, the truth is, if you do it right, you can do both. Because did you get that bottom right corner of that graph you put up there? a 12-time return, that's taking your million-dollar business and growing it into a $12 million business. Now you can have fun.
Now you, and that's a small company, right? Big companies you turn into, you know, lots more than that. And and so you can have your payday, but it happens from uh, making investments. Uh, Vega Supply. There's our worksheet for where we're going to work on the. Uh, I didn't realize I had it open from uh, earlier. I want us to now introduce the people that you interviewed. I'll turn the rest of the lights on. For this, there's a couple things I'd like us to do. Uh, as you interview the person, I mean, as you tell us about your interview, I would like you to stand up um, and point out the person that you interviewed and that you are introducing so that we all can look at that person, not you. Uh, if they're here, uh, if they're not here, introduce them anyway. Uh, and if you weren't here to interview someone, uh, when it's your turn, please stand up and introduce yourself. Those uh, five things there. Your name, what you do, uh, if you have a trip anywhere in the world at no cost, where would it be, why would it be there, and finally, what is the first sketch at this moment of their retirement plan. Uh, Jake, we often start with you in the back corner. Uh, let's do that. Uh, the gentleman that I interviewed is not here. His uh, name is Dylan Webster. I asked him what he did for a living. He said he worked for River, uh, Wood, Wood River Furniture. Uh, they build cabinets and, and uh, all wood furniture, uh, kind of custom, high-end stuff. Now, Dylan sits here in the right. middle. Those of you remember uh, Dylan and Alyssa, uh, and they're yeah. traveling now. His dad's business, uh, and so he's uh, growing. He's going to grew up close to our owner, uh, and a nice owner oh. of all that. So okay. Same area up there. Uh, I asked him where he would like to go, and he said someplace tropical. And the reason why is because he's never been anywhere tropical before. Uh, and then I asked him what his retirement plan is, and he said he's not 100%. He's still young, but he's looking for some Roth IRA. We will talk a little bit about Roth IRAs. There's some positives there, and there's some negatives there uh, in terms of how much you can invest in it. And one of the questions we all will ask at some point in time is, how much money do I need in retirement? And we'll talk a little bit about that in the later. This is not a class on retirement. But you kind of have to have a target in mind of what you're going to need. Uh, you know, how much is enough, how much is too much. Uh, there is no such thing, probably, as too much. But there certainly is such a thing as not enough. And, uh, and that's so we need to have some range of that figured out. Uh, we will talk a bit about that, even though that's not what this class is about. Thank you. Eric. All right, I wasn't here, but uh, my name is Eric. I work for Stewart Outdoor Living. I do awnings, outdoor locations, solar screens. And if I go anywhere in the world, I go to Bora Bora because I like natural relations and like beaches. And retirement plan, uh, hopefully, I have enough money to retire. <laughs> so just a question, um, Stuart hasn't always been known as Stuart Outdoor Living. How long has that been the name? Like maybe a little over a year. Okay. That. And, and do any of you know a bit about the history of Stuart and maybe why they changed the name? He changed it to his, to his son, right? Because it was Stuart Awning before, right? It was Stuart Awning at one time, for sure, because they were in the awning, awning business. Yeah. And Stuart Outdoor Living sounds like a completely different thing, right? And and it, it is. And I, I don't think that name change came as much because of, I mean, there may have been some technical reasons for a new corporation or something like that, but you can always make a new corporate name without anybody knowing you made a new corporate name by adding something on at the end of it that nobody ever really sees, uh, or spelling something different or whatever you want to do. But, uh, so there may have been some family transition there, but it's more than that, it's a market expansion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Into uh, aggregate product lines that fit with the core business that they started with. This is a normal, uh, this is an exciting uh, evolution of a company. To start out in one thing and then be able to add stuff on it in this case, there's complementary. You do you have all kinds of other things that go on in outdoor living, and whether this is considered uh, 
tropical or not. I, you know, a lot of people think of St. George as kind of tropical, uh, I, and I do. I don't have to shovel anything here. That's part of the reason <laughs> I, I like it here. Uh, but but the the idea of, of broadening the name of a business to encompass a an expansion that they have already done in this case, but it could be done in anticipation of an expansion that you want to do. Uh, we may see very large companies doing that, or we have seen, I'll give you some examples later, but that was just a comment on that, it had not to do with your retirement plan at all, which may or may not have to do with Stewart Outdoor Living, but I love the name change. I think that it more, you do, I don't know what all you do, but outdoor living uh, is involving a lot of stuff that's fun, it's family stuff, it's having kitchens, and I don't know if you do pools, and you know no, that no, yet? Not yet. Not yet. Could <laughs> could be, uh, but but expanding to an altogether larger, uh, encompassing uh, uh, thing that, that that your customers were buying already. For, certainly, they put an awning on. They could put furniture on it, right? And that furniture is, you know, as expensive as the furniture you got in your living room, uh, or maybe more so because it lasts in the sun out here. And and so you know, why not why 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 not capture that from your customer? They need it, so you know, uh, expanding the business in that direction is great. Um, I had Alyssa. She's also not right here. She also with Dylan over there. She also works for Wood River Furniture. Uh, her plans on vacation is going to New Zealand, playground of the world, visiting a set of Lord of the Rings Hobbiton, as well as the history of New Zealand. Um, she also said she didn't know anything about retirement plans. Can that be enough? The answer is yes. It, it can be. That's so. So you know, don't uh, you know? I mean, I don't know how enough is how much is enough. I, you know, if your burn rate is super high, you know, I think that Elton John's burn rate at one point I saw was one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars a day, and so you know, some people have better parties than others do. Wow. <laughs> and, and he also faced bankruptcy at one point in time. So you know, uh, we see a lot of people that have that kind of income and win a lottery and <laughs> don't manage it, right? And, 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 but a, we have a, a number of people in our town that, that work at Lighthouse Foods. Lighthouse Foods is a, you know, a, a manufacturer by Walmart distribution there. You all know uh, I eat their blue cheese salad dressing in the refrigerated section of your local grocery store because I think it's the best blue cheese salad dressing that's out there. Uh, and it's made here, which is pretty cool. Uh, but that company is is different than than most other companies in St. George. Uh, that company was built by a family in uh, Sandpoint, Idaho, and uh, it grew. They had a restaurant, made salad dressing for the restaurant that they owned, and, and then it became people started to buy their salad dressing because they liked it. They hey, can we buy some of that? And they put it up in quart jars and sell it to customers at the restaurant. And the business grew, and as the business grew, they made all the money they wanted to make. Uh, the family did, and they said, you know, for us to really go to the next level, we got to give this company to our employees. And they did. Now, they, they kept some, they, you know, they, but they didn't keep the majority. Uh, they gave the company to their employees, and they created what's a true uh, ESOP, uh, an employee-owned uh, company. And so today, uh, there is a valuation mechanism to say what the company is worth. They have manufacturing facilities in four four manufacturing facilities in in three states, and Michigan here in Idaho, and um, they're doing well. Uh, every year the company is valued, and based on the value of the company and the amount of time you've worked there and the pay grade level you're at, you get a piece of the action, and that is invested. Uh, I mean, it's vested in you after you stay there so long. Uh, uh, not like five years, I think it's a it's a tiered vesting program, uh, and uh, eventually, and they're they're contributing to your, uh, 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 I think it's called a 403, not a 401, but it's the same type of instrument just coming from a different source, a employee owned, uh, but it's managed exactly the same way, and so it's very possible to have a line job at Lighthouse, work there your career, and have depending on what happens to the company, but over a million dollars in your, your retirement account 
at that company. And you know that's that's not a promise. That's based. It's a it's a volatile market, right? People might start not eating salad dressing, and you know, and they had trouble with COVID, and then they they figured around, uh, they, and they they didn't have any losses. Uh, they managed through COVID when restaurants closed in America and uh, around the world. So so uh, a a personal investment program in a four hundred one k or a four hundred three or a five hundred. You know, there, there, are several, there are a number of, of instruments depending on who you work for. The uh, state of Utah has a different, you know. And so, but, but just working a regular job and regularly investing can turn into a big amount of money. And that's the point here. You don't have to have a windfall where you, you know, you offer your, your Uncle Larry and, and get, his, get his money, uh, you know, his life insurance plan or anything like that. Okay, let's keep going. Say that last part again. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, and again, just like lighthouses, uh, all of our 401ks plans are worth very little right now. And it requires consistency and time for that to become something of value. And it could become something of great value, uh, enough to work for us. Uh, because Social Security may not do it. Uh, it, might, it might not end it. I interviewed Brad. And uh, he works for property management, is it Four Point? Oh, Foresight. Foresight, okay, sorry. Foresight, he's currently a property supervisor. Mm -hmm. He occasionally works with some of the wealthy property owners, kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, right now. His dream vacation would be to the Maldives because he's worked so hard the last few years, he hasn't gone anywhere. Um, his retirement plan is to work his way up to a regional director manager. Um, and become a personal assistant to some of these wealthy owners. So I think that he has 401k benefits and retirement benefits right now in the company. Yeah, and just try to like max yeah. out like the health savings account. They do health yeah. savings contribution, 401k management. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Rob. Hi. Uh, I interviewed Brandon here in front of us. <coughs> um, he works at Best Buy, but not for long. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his trip would be to the United Kingdom because he's never been outside the U.S. and he's interested in the different culture and things that they have going on there. I asked him what he was going to do for retirement and he said um, real estate. Okay. Are you gonna, what are you going to do in real estate? Um, just own properties. Okay. One of the beauties of real estate investment you know, there's lots of ways to invest in real estate. Um, uh, a lot of good, solid ways to invest in real estate. And a lot of shady ways to invest in real estate. So you want to make sure you stay on the same side that, that it, all of us, that's, it, that is sustainable. But one of the beauties, if you think about investing in real estate, if you're able to buy houses or apartments uh, or commercial properties that cash flow, and if you can buy it on margin, what do we mean by that? You buy it using somebody else's money, right? A loan, a uh, home, a mortgage. You know, so if you know, one, I've not, I've not ever invested in real estate in St. George except the house I've lived in. All of my real estate investments have been elsewhere because they cash flow better. The cost of housing is stupid high here, and it's difficult. Uh, in most markets, uh, at most times in our market here, to make it cash flow. Right at this second in time, rents have gone up to the point where they you can cash flow real estate investments here over a short term. And and by cash flowing, what I mean is uh, you let's just I'm making up numbers that are not sustainable with math, but uh, I'm making up numbers. Let's suppose you you fi find a distressed house that you can buy for $400,000 and you can put a little work into it you think you can make it worth five hundred, but in the meantime, you think you can rent it out uh, and, and uh, uh, as is, without putting more work in it, rent it out as is. And so you're going to take a mortgage on that. In current market, you're going to need about 20% down, right? 
uh, in some markets before the crash, you could buy houses with zero debt. Uh, that meant that you could use all of somebody else's money to buy that property, and you could rent it out for more than your mortgage was, and you would pocket the excess, that means cash flow, the positive cash flow, while somebody, and you get their money, their rent, you pay the bank on your note, and you keep what's left. That's a positive cash flow. If your mortgage is higher than the rent that you're collecting, that's a negative cash flow. Still could be a good investment. Because either way, somebody else is paying off most of your debt. And so after enough years, you own that property free and clear, and you've never spent a dime of your own money on it if you got it for zero down. Now, if you got it for 5% down, 10% down, 20% down, depends on a lot of factors. You know, you may have a program available to you for uh, earning it in the VA or different instruments that allow you to do one transaction anyway without uh, meeting the normal standard of 20% down. Uh, your credit has to stay good to do that, but that's buying real estate that over time somebody else is paying off for you. And at the end of that day, you own a lot more than you actually ever invested in your own money. That's the way it's supposed to work. Now, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, uh, let's suppose, um, well, personal experience. I had a house in Washington Field that, that I owned, uh, and fortunately I bought it at a, at a reasonable time, but the market value of it dropped $200,000. Now, if I'd have bought it at the height and had to sell it when it dropped, you know, that was 2008 when the market adjusted here, and if the timing was that I needed to sell it then, I would have taken you know, a quarter million dollar loss. So that's what could go wrong. Uh, it's can you hold the long term? Long term, it was fine. We all, we all, the, the market corrected and everybody's house value dropped. In the last two months, Zillow has devalued all our real estate in Washington County by a little bit. Uh, it was going up every month uh, by, by estimations of value. Uh, and it's corrected a tiny bit. I don't know if it will continue to correct or not. But as you invest in real estate, this is a factor. Uh, it's a beautiful plan. Uh, you know, a lot of people will buy, um, have a next door neighbor that, that owns uh, Family Dollar and Dollar General properties. And so he doesn't operate them. And Dollar, Dollar General doesn't want to buy real estate and put money in buildings. A lot of capital. They want to put their capital in something that's going to turn faster because it's borrowed money to them, they're a public company, you can look and see their deal. So they'd rather just pay, pay rent. Uh, Walgreens does this. So they don't build the bricks and mortar of their property. Some local guy, uh, family, lady, somebody locally owns the real estate, builds the building to suit. That's when you see the advertisement, will build to suit. That's an owner that said, if you come in and you want to build a longhorn steakhouse here, um, and uh, that's what uh, Glenn Denning did, the guy that owns the, John, the Jimmy John's is in this town. He built Longhorn Steakhouses and made millions doing it on stock options from the company as their contractors, the builders that built their restaurants. They were all the same restaurant. They weren't owned by Longhorn. They were owned by whoever the local real estate investor was that says, I'll build your steakhouse here. And someday I know you may go out of business and I'm stuck with an empty building that looks like a steakhouse. We'll have to convert it into something else. We've seen those happening here in town. Somebody owns the Kmart building on Buff Street, right? It looks like a Kmart. Still got a sign out front that says Kmart. What are you going to do with that? Well, so far, they're just making a warehouse out of it. So dividing it up and putting people's excess stock in there. Someday, that will get converted into a new thing, and a landlord will have new cash generated from a new lease. So they'll do OK. But when the people you lease to go out, you do bad. And so that's the, the ups and downs of commercial uh, lending. Family Dollar is a good place. My neighbor that's doing it, he's got stores in Mississippi and Alabama and uh, places he's never lived and two that he's never seen. Uh, but it's a good investment model. And so real estate can be a great retirement, especially if you're able to work the model so somebody else pays your mortgage, your loans. So somebody else buys them for you. And hopefully by the time you get old enough, you owe them all free and clear, so now all of that rental income doesn't go to pay the bank anymore. 
it goes to pay your lifestyle retire. At that point, you don't need to work, right? That's the objective. So that's a sound retirement plan. Uh, well done. Andrew, you're up. Um, I interviewed Denver. Uh, he currently works at Pop John's. He is the GM with a small holding uh, in that. If he could go anywhere, it would be to Fiji because um, he wants to see a tropical location, something new, something he hasn't seen before. Um, and the retirement plan is to be the franchise owner here locally in 15 years and then take a step back at 71. 71. 71. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, here's hoping you can do it at 61. <laughs> Enjoy a little more on that. Now, this is an interesting thing with the GM having a, a small holding in the franchise or the business. This is commonly done. And if you are on the end of, you're the owner, think about the brilliance of cutting in somebody that's there to run the day to day. Because you go weeks or months sometimes out seeing the owner. Mm -hmm. They don't have to show up. Because they know you, they've trained you, and you you've got their back. But why do you have the back? You got a, you've got skin in the game. Yeah. And so they gain. And, and Outback Steakhouse model is exactly that way. When you see the the, the general manager's name on the front door of this one, when you walk in, I don't remember what it is. It's changed because that guy, the one of the guys, has been promoted and now uh, has more holding. But they give 10 percent of the store to the proprietor of the, the general manager of the local store. That's their, and that's a public company, so you can see how they do that. That puts skin in the game on the person that you are trusting to run that operation while you're gone. Now you, you, know, you have the ability to swoop in at any time and check on what they're doing. You have the ability to fire them still. Uh, it's a contract in most cases, so it's drawn up by, by a team, so it's a fair contract in both directions. But that's a good model where you have somebody else watching your cash and helping grow your cash in your store or in your business. This doesn't have to be a store. It could be any kind of business. That model is a sustainable model. We have seen some multi-level marketing uh, entities in Utah try that model and turn to be illegal, What some of the, the way they structured it. So structuring it has to be so it's not a Ponzi scheme where they're buying their way into the pyramid, uh, which is, if it looks like that, it smells like that, you're going to prison. And so you don't want it to do, you want to have your attorneys carefully structure it so that it's a, it's a good incentive and it's a legal incentive, a good way to do it. And I like the idea because when we got skin in the game, we care more. Uh, you always drive your own pickup truck a little bit better than you drive the company truck. There's just something about it. And, and uh, uh, so we, 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 we uh, uh, can, uh, uh, kind of capitalize on that in our retirement as we want to do nothing and we want to have our businesses potentially still producing income for us. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. I have Callie. She works at uh, Mr. Appliance as in a secretary-like position and she would like to take a trip in Iceland because she's never been and it's really pretty and she would love to eventually own a small inn on her own on a good-sized plot of land where she can live and also uh, rent out so as her retirement. Have a revenue stream from that. What kind of neighborhood would you like to be in? Wherever I end up. I don't know. <laughs> Florida, Idaho, here. Well, a th couple of you have talked about your retirement, and, and, and we, we look at um, portability or transferability. Having, being in the in business, bed and breakfast or hotel or motel or uh, or, or a tavern type of inn uh, uh, can be done anywhere in the world, right? Everywhere anybody is at, that business is a business. Whether you're local or not, uh, that's a model that works because people move around and they need a place to stay and they need a place to eat and that's worldwide. And so, you know, having that as the plan, being open to where, you know, uh, to some degree our life is, is driven by the opportunity that comes our way. And if you're religious, you don't believe those opportunities are, are random. You think that uh, they're intended to be or crafted for each one of us. Uh, and, and that may be the fact. And this class isn't about that piece. But a lot of things come to us uh, that I don't think are accidental. I think that we've prepared right, right now. You're grooming yourself to recognize opportunity, to know what to do with opportunity, to try to, uh, to manage that opportunity as it comes its way, when it comes your way. 
its way, your way. So you may, you may just find the ideal thing and that becomes your retirement plan. And I hope you do and I hope it's in a fabulous place. And what a, what a nice thing to have uh, your income to be something you enjoy and have it actually provide for where you live. In the, in the case of that, uh, that I'd much rather rent uh, a, a room, hotel room from somebody that's on site uh, and that cares about it. Uh, I've liked bed and breakfasts and uh, with Airbnbs, that's a model that's right now feasible. Um, Joel in his class has been talking about doing that with her house right now uh, on uh, the road up to, um, to uh, what's it? Zion? Colob Canyon, up, uh, the Colob Reservoir, on the road up to, yeah, at Zion. And so, you know, that's not something that's out of our reach. We all could <coughs> actually start that kind of a thing right where we're at in, more, in some cases. Some people have enough uh, space that they can do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I had Landon, and Landon's job currently is just school, just focusing on school, learning more. Uh, if you could take a trip anywhere, he said he would take a trip to Paris, specifically the Eiffel Tower and some of the historical sites. And then for his retirement, he said he doesn't really have a solid plan quite yet, uh, but the 401k probably is going to be in the books. Okay. All right. Very good. Nice to have a blank slate for the moment and crafting out your career and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, going to school is what we're all doing. Every one of us are right now. And uh, your turn. Uh, I interviewed Eli, who works for a still manufactured company. If you could go anywhere, he would go to Iceland to visit the old castles. No way. Two people in the room? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Retirement plan is 401k and wrap Okay, the Roth is part of the plan. Okay, and and in your case, it's the the, the company is part of just part of the vehicle, right? It's and so the the marketable things are the skills you bring to the company currently, and whether they choose to want you long term is up to them. Uh, but you intend to apply those skills, the management skills, wherever there's the best opportunity. You know, we are renting our time as entrepreneurs uh, first, whether we work for ourselves officially, or whether we just rent our time to another employer, we still are working for ourselves. And that's why we're kind of having this conversation about retirement, is that's the business, that's the business that matters most to your kids. That's the business that matters most to your, your, your entire life as you go, is how are we managing the business of me? You know, are we, are we allocating capital properly there? Because the rules are exactly the same as what we just saw for a Fortune 500 company as they are for Steve Carwell. Not an associate, it's just Steve Carwell. You know, I, I'm responsible for my business. Uh, and and uh, uh, you, you, your business plan can be to suck off society if you want to do that. You don't have to work. You don't have to develop a retirement program. You can panhandle. Uh, we used to have hobos in the United States, and that was a, a viable, respectable profession. Uh, people did that, and, and uh, they provide uh, migrant uh, uh, labor on farms, and and uh, uh, and it was not a it was a business plan, and that model is still an effective model. It's got its weirdness to it, and it's got its legality issues in places. But we can do what we choose. Uh, some of us are better. Some of them are better lifestyles than others. Brad, you up. So I interviewed Mindy. She's currently a stay-at-home mom right now, going to classes at night. And I didn't get the trip. We we're talking about the Maldives, so if you said it, I apologize. I, 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 I didn't write it down. I think I said the Maldives too. I wanted to like disconnect and go somewhere tropical, and you kind of wanted to like enjoy paradise and just yeah. You know. I didn't get that written down, so yeah. that's the answer. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. And then for retirement, you're thinking about later on in the future selling the company, maybe going into real estate or buying properties and renting them out for residual income. Okay, well done. And you're a salesman on, as far as the mold eyes are concerned, right? Yeah, I've seen some pictures. My like, oh, well, you know, you're on like the huts out there. Just, you know. I, I was can, like, I, huts on the water, and like, you know, that's where I was like, I could, too. I could totally, yeah, I could, I could totally get into that as well. Yeah. For a while. Oh, I, you know, I don't know. How <laughs> thanks, yeah. thanks. Yeah, hey. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> they don't have internet. Whoopsie. So, <laughs> she, she won't want to stay as long as you think. Oh, no. <laughs> Next trip. Yeah. It's hard to buy stuff. 
<laughs> uh, you're up. Uh, um, I got Brock, and he has a he owns a sand and gravel pit. And for vacation, he would go anywhere in the U.S. because he has no desire to leave. <laughs> well, he said, I want to go somewhere because I've never been in the U.S. And I said, well, I want to stay in the U.S. because I have no desire to leave. And um, he's just wanting to build up his, uh, his business and uh, sell it to the big boys. And, and so what was the last part? Sell it to the big boys. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and has that happened? Is that is that a, a pipe dream or has that happened? Happened. Totally yeah, happened. Yeah. Has it happened in this town? Yeah, yeah totally. Anybody remember John uh, J and J? Uh, you know so where the movie Sunrock. theater's at on Sunset? That was yeah. a gravel pit, right? And J and J built a business and a lot of other stuff, building materials and things like that, hardware. Uh, and uh, at some point in time, uh, sold to who? Sunrock. Yep, W.W. Clyde Company that owns Sunrock. And so that was a nice cash out. Uh, I was working for Wilfred Clyde at the time that happened. I know a lot about that one, uh, representing the other side. <laughs> and and uh, uh, it's very, very possible. Gravel pits are interesting places. Uh, it's, we'll talk it's done it more recent. So I'm sorry? It's done that more recent. Sunrock acquired Bryce Christensen's pit south of that's correct. I forgot. That's just barely. That just happened the last yeah, few months, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so in that case, there, Bryce got to the spot where he was enjoying life working, uh, but had an opportunity to cash out. And uh, I don't know if he'll. I don't know if he'll make it. <laughs> you know, he, he, he's he's got enough uh, hobbies that he might make it. He's talking about building a racetrack down there. And that, but that, he still he still has his south pit. Does he? And he still has. His Gravel yard and uh, he just sold the black one. So okay. So just uh, okay. Can sell any trucks. Cash his boy runs that now. Okay. Well then that's that's a family plan then, uh, you know to I would guess and he got some cash to go play and that's a good thing and and that's kind of a description of a win if you really think about it. Sell peel off and sell enough of your business that you've got cash and you've got a lifestyle that you're capable of supporting at this point without having to go to work if you didn't want to on, on that, that part of it. And then but having enough work to play uh, to keep from going crazy. Because a lot of people, um, you all have seen this and you'll see it more as you age, uh, people retire and die. And there's something weird that goes on there. They've, they've worked all their life to be able to retire and when they do it's not that their body was just waiting for that and it goes, it's that there's an emotional change in our brain and our lifestyle and our purpose to some changes. And if we ever get to the point that we feel like our purpose in life is our job, that's a dangerous spot to be in. That's not who we are. That is just describes what we do. Who we are is something else. And if you are better at defining who you are now and that's who you stay true to, retirement will be a gas. It'll be it'll be the fulfillment of what you want to be. If you are if your identity is working for the man, then when you don't any longer work for the man, you've got an identity crisis because you don't know who you are. And and I I've gone through that in my life enough to be able to talk authoritatively about it. Um, I I stepped down from corporate management, started a company, and I had no employees. And and you'd go to church and somebody would want to. Yeah, hi, who are you? And our answer was always what it said on the business card. You know, this is me. No, that's not me. That was me. That was what my job was, but that's not who I am. And to be able to talk about who we are uh, as a, absent of our job, what, our, what we do is not who we are. And, and so that's an important reason to have part of this conversation because we want to we build and manage our business first and manage the businesses that we start and are involved in and managing the businesses that we work in, we want to learn how to help do that. But first, it's it's for us. So that's kind of that's kind of that. Your turn. All right, yeah, Andrew. Uh, his occupation, what he does, is he's the production manager at Wilding Wall Beds. I asked him what are his, what are some of his responsibilities there. Um, time management, um, making sure people are on task, doing what they need to do for obviously production. 
and uh, developing the talent there for his crew. Uh, he's been there for 16 years, um, worked his way up to production management, uh, manager, excuse me. Uh, where he'd like to go would be the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Um, very beautiful place, you know, scenery's great there, and also he'd like to go there with his wife to go to the different distilleries there uh, for Scotch, right? For oh, the yeah. Scot Scotch yeah. distilleries there. Oh, yeah. Um, his retirement plan, uh, the vice president of production there at Wilding Walvids. Um, he's hoping to take over that position in about five years um, and then maybe retire around the age of 75. Okay. We see age 75. <laughs> <laughs> hoping you can do that before then if you want to. Right. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of people that don't want to retire. I, I'm past retirement age and I don't want to. And uh, our president is maybe should, but we past <laughs> retirement age. The president before him was past retirement age. We, we see a lot of important people worldwide that choose to stay working. And, and I think the guess is there that for me, it's as long as you're having fun and able to make a contribution, you ought to do it. Um, if you're not having fun and not making a contribution, you really need to retire for everybody else's uh, benefit. So there's a couple things I want to just wrap up on. Thank you, everybody, first of all, um, for thinking it through and interviewing somebody and reporting on it or reporting your, uh, yourself if you weren't interviewed. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for standing up in class and talking because that was an uncomfortable moment for most of you, maybe all, but at least for most. Uh, we don't like to talk. We don't like to stand up and have to talk in front of the class. Uh, what it proved is that you can do it and nothing bad happened. So thank you for participating in that. Those of you that would never like to, uh, just because that's not the way you're wired. I'm not trying to change the way you're wired, but in business we have to talk. And whether we naturally like to do it or are uh, fabulously skilled at it, some people have silver tongues and you know, that when we hear them talk, we go, wow, that's fabulous how they talk. We also think half of what they say is bullshit. So you know, uh, there's, there's, there's some trade-off there at, at doing that. So, but anyway, thank you for doing that. Uh, I'd like you to do more of that. Uh, I think every one of us has things to contribute to the collective learning that we're trying to do here, so do that. The reason I ask where you would go if money was no object is interesting to me compared with the question of what's your retirement plan. We all have places already figured out that we want to go, but we don't have our retirement plan figured out how we want to get there, because those places aren't free to go to. I said if money was no object. Well, money is an object. And it's always going to cost us to travel. Uh, it costs us in the, the, the issue of going there uh, and the, the costs associated with that. Uh, but the, the, the lost opportunity and being gone from whatever our life is here, there's a cost to that as well. And so in spite of those costs, we all have a kind of a, you know, a bucket list or something of places we'd like to go. And, and, and maybe they're not far away. Maybe you're just as happy with the, you know, the plane crash at the top of uh, West Mountain that you'd like to hike up there someday and see it. It's right here, you know, and, and maybe that's where you'd, you'd want to go. And, and, and that's fine, but I want us to get to the point where you're thinking really in terms of what are the checklist of things that you really want to get accomplished because once we understand what they are for your life, not for mine and not for your neighbors, for your life. Now, if you're married, it ought to be kind of an agreement. Uh, so that, that, that you can be happier longer and that you, can, you have a much better chance of achieving it if two of you are working together on the same thing. You also have challenges. Uh, and so, you know, having, having those things talked about it, we all change, our <coughs> opportunities change, and having that an important part of who we are now and where we're going uh, will be really helpful to your life, I think. And, and, and being able to uh, have that idea. It doesn't have to be cast in concrete plan because I think cast in concrete plans are problematic. Uh, it, we lose flexibility there. Uh, we lose the ability to respond to opportunity that comes out of nowhere and, and uh, we're too set on what the plan is. Don't get that way. Be open to things that come your way. They don't ever come by accident, I don't think, and, and evaluate the stuff that comes your way. But having a plan in the back of our mind and several of you uh, identified plans that I think are sound and will work. Uh, hoping for a 401k insinuates that you're going to have a job and not have your own. Uh, and so, you know, that may not 
be as sure because what if something happens to you? You can't work anymore. You, you get an illness or, or you know, some trauma happens to your life. and some, You have to go to a place to help family where you can't apply your career. And, you know, there are things that, that really can alter that. The more control we have over our future, the better, the better we are in terms of trying to ultimately get there. And I know that none of us ever have control over it. I do realize that. It's all, life is, is, is uh, very, very uncertain, and, and that's part of what makes it a very interesting place to be. Uh, it's, but it can be richly rewarding, and more so if we have some focus and some plan and some thought of how we're going to do that, and, and to do that within the guidelines that you set forth for yourself. And I would suggest those to be good ethical uh, guidelines. I think that doing the right thing gets us rewarded more than doing the wrong thing, although we know people that have done the wrong thing, it seems like they've been rewarded. I don't think in the long term they are. Uh, but for us to, to develop this, these plans, I'd like us to have those top of mind more than just back of mind. That's why I've asked the question. That's why you have an assignment. And then we won't talk about it more. This is just, I, I just want us to establish that what we're talking about does matter. Uh, and it matters to you personally. And it matters to your family and your sphere of influence, uh, how well you execute that. If we don't execute it correctly, there's nothing more stressful than being broke. And not that money is everything, it's not. But there's nothing more stressful than being broke. And, and getting ourselves in that situation, a lot of times we can't help it. Things happen. And it's survivable. We've all been there in one way or the other to one degree or the other. But it's better if we can avoid it, right? It's better if we can, not the, the, the pursuit of money, it's the pursuit of a plan that, that, that keeps us within the, the positive cash flow side of things. That's what he was putting out together at the... Your business won't succeed that way, and you personally won't succeed that way either. So having the plans that allow us to do that, uh, then that makes it easier for us to invest capital towards that plan. And so with that, I think we've run out of time. I'm still a minute early, uh, but we're done. Have a great weekend, and don't forget your assignment. It's a week, do a week from today in whatever form you want to turn it in. Have a great weekend, and uh, we will see you on Tuesday.